This next story has been suppressed by mainstream media. Let's go to Andreas for more. Everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarians. Recent Tartarians. Recent Tartarians. Hello. Welcome to the Exatos. Tune in for another exciting episode of Wonder, Imagination and Discovery. Recent Tartarians. Sometimes I look at the moon and just think, this thing's beautiful. Baby, when I met you, there was peace on no. Что касается энергии Нэнэни, то она превышает ядерную в немыслимое число раз. 10 в 74 степени. Thank you for watching Exatos. Keep listening. Remember if you enjoy the video please follow and subscribe and share and support, it really helps. Coming up next, X Letters. By the way that's gone, if you didn't record that, that's gone forever. It's gone. Hey everybody. Well, we have a really exciting show. Um, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Shiva. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you guys doing? I'm fantastic. I'm really excited. For years, I've actually, you know, there's this is kind of an interesting moment, right? I feel like for myself to get to meet the person who invented email, essentially the patenter, uh, amongst other things that you've done in your life. This is a re really amazing contribution to everybody. Everything that we're doing right now is kind of based on uh, this kind of ID, this idea, right? So I wanted to thank you for that. And then also say, you know, maybe you want to introduce, you know, uh, that you're running for president now as well. Yeah, look, we're running for president in a solution based model, because what's happened is if you look at all these, the entire um, political model, excuse me, <coughs> is essentially um, a racket, that's all theater. And it's essentially a theatrical model that's positioned to make sure that working people never build a bottoms up movement and people don't take matters into their own hands and raise their consciousness. That's what this is all about. And that was very, very different from the framers of the Constitution. You know, you, you can look at even great religious leaders, philosophers, etc. The idea was always to compel people to raise their consciousness. And what we see now is not only a concerted effort by the obvious establishment, you know, the people who are the obvious fascist, but more importantly, I think right before we started, Rafael was talking about the wellness company, and you can see that the establishment has gotten a lot more clever to promote the not so obvious establishment, people who literally steal the words of the people who are actual change agents, mimic them. And their goal is to drive people into what I call the swarm. You know, there's a video that everyone should go watch on shatterthesworm.com. In 15 minutes, every human being should watch that. It took me 50 years to do that on a whiteboard in terms of really being able to consolidate this very potent knowledge. But we live in a, a very his, a interesting time because every Tom, Dick and Harry is talking about truth, right? Truth, truth, truth. Stupid Vivek the Snake or Joe Rogan or fucker Carlson, all these people. But they're the farthest from the truth as you can imagine because um, truth is frankly passe unless it's powered by two other very, very important uh, elements. One is, when are you telling the truth? When? When did you tell the truth? When? Did you come and say, oh yeah, the building burned down and it had an electrical issue and we should have fixed it after everything's happened? And then you write a book about it like Booby fucking Kennedy does about Fauci, right? Do you talk about virology and the viruses maybe? Did you talk about it in 1993, 1994, which is what I did? when first, you know, John Duisberg exposed this against uh, Gallo and Fauci, or did you wait, you know, 20 years and say, oh yeah, there's no viruses and then create a whole bunch of shit around it. You know what I'm saying? Where the fuck were you for 30 years? 
And that so when is important. And then the second part of that is are you telling the truth to empower people to build a movement to destroy those people who've been against the truth, right? Or are you just saying it because now it's in vogue to tell the truth? And these are very, very fundamental questions because when a fool like Vivek the Snake has a truth that on, when Trump starts Truth Social, when you know he's a Zionist cocksucker and has nothing to do with the truth, we have to raise a much higher standard. And my life has been about that. You know, I didn't have the luxury to just talk about truth. You know, I came from a caste system, which I was very interested in eliminating. You know, email was not done at MIT, even though I got four degrees from there. The level of abuse I underwent when I humbly started sharing the facts about the invention of email, when my stuff went into Smithsonian, is a real story. You see, the fact is, it's undeniable. I have the code. I named it email. I have the copyright. It's black and white. Why did a bunch of liberal Zionist hoodlums create, even attempt, and this is where it, it's backfiring on them because everyday people are getting it. And so the story of the invention of email, the facts about it are wonderful education to see what happens, the, the vitriol that those in power do when things do not come from their tent, you know, from their bastions of power, profit control. That's why the invention of email is powerful because I, I was 14 years old. I didn't grow up in Silicon Valley where you had all the VCs, you know, and furthermore, I didn't sign non-disclosure agreements with IBM and HP or walking in and out of our lab. You say we did it because as a 14 year old kid, I was quite amazed that I had the opportunity to even get access to many computers, work at a medical school, going to NYU when I was 14. So all those things were quite uh, important, but I worked my butt off. You know, email was the a system. It's not the simple exchange of text messages. It's a system of all those interconnected features put all together, the inbox, the outbox, the folders, in an electronic form, in 50,000 lines of code, in 8K or less of memory, and delivered to civilians who were secretaries, who had never seen the typewriter or the, or the keyboard, for example, and who these old white dudes in lab coats think didn't think women were capable of using the computer. That's what I did as a 14-year-old. I had great respect for these women. And so... Just like Philo Farnsworth, the 14-year-old kid in Franklin, Idaho, invented TV, which RCA stole from him. So great innovations actually occur on the edges, outside of the military industrial academic complex, and they're not driven by power, profit, and control. This is a brainwashing that's been, it's done, it's one of the most inhumane things that's been done. So the problem that they have is I'm still alive, and I'm not a good Indian. You know, most Indians are supposed to talk like this and move their head and say, okay, you know, fuck me up the ass or something, you know, beat the hell out of me. That's what Gandhi did. OK, I'm not like that. I fight back. And this is what bothers these liberal elites who are actually the real racists. The real racists are the liberal elites who want to keep you in your little box, me in my little box. And as long as you're in that box, then you're OK. OK, but as long as you step outside of your box, they don't like that. Right. They don't like the fact that a non nerd looking guy actually invented email. That's what really bothers him before he came to MIT. Had I done the invention of email at MIT, it would have been anointed and properly blessed. I don't know. So here's the thing. <clears throat> so I could been wanting to say this for a second is that like you got to think about how the MIT system, how these military industrial complex systems worked for the WASP. Like they're designed to have a centralized. This is exactly how Facebook and everything is now, right? You have a central thing. This is the opposite of email. Your idea is completely, it's peer to peer. Right. This is so if some kid wanted to send a file to somebody else like the mail, it's the it's counterintuitive to the elite. What you came up with. I don't think it could have come out of MIT. not only that. What's yeah. also interesting, Andres, when I when you send an email through my system, I never transported it. And we it was done very efficiently. Email was there was only one copy of it, you say. Wow. In some ways, it was a reference to it. Now we send, I mean, we, we waste a shitload of memory when we send an email, when you think right. about it, okay? Right. So, and every feature was in there. But the point is, after I came to MIT, I did many, many other innovations. I was on the front page of MIT for inventing many things. And that was when I was a good brown-skinned model minority under the aegis of them. But when this went into the Smithsonian, you know, many years later... Uh, when Time Magazine wrote an article that you brought up, this creates a contradictory problem because um, email cannot be invented in a 
non-white, right, poor working class community called Newark, New Jersey, outside of the military industrial complex, where the motivation was not military power. You see, right. it was yeah. for civilian reasons. In fact, many things have come out for civilian reasons. Um, and so the, the thing is, so that's what's, that's what's so powerful about the story of email. Um, and then the journey I went through and having been very conscious about this thing called the caste system in India, and that's what we've created here. We have a modern day caste system, but it's a multiracial aristocracy, which runs that caste system, black, white, brown, you know, elites have to perpetuate this thing that, um, you have to go to these bastions of power. And then when you're anointed by them, and you can even be a dropout like Zuckerberg or, or Bill Gates, but it's cool to go to these institutions and act like you're a techie. You say, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They, they've created the genre of what an intelligent person must look like. Big glasses must look like a nerd, you know, have a little twitch here and there, right? Have some weird oddity. And I used to see kids at MIT come in in their freshman year, normal sounding human beings after six months having twitches, changing their voice, you know, you know, drooling a little bit, you know, talking, you know, waving their hands and these really weird gestures, right? Which they never did before. It was almost like you had to be all fucked up sounding and then you were smart. You wow. couldn't be a normal person, be a good athlete, you know, speak well, be social and invent email. You see, that wasn't allowed. Same with the mat, the concept of the mad artist, right? Or the mad scientist. And when you look back, at you know history and ancient science, ancient systems of yoga, ancient philosophies, the concept of the scientist, the warrior, the healer, we're all one. You were supposed to be a whole human being. All the archetypes are made up of that. But they this this dysfunctional, siloed way of treating a human being in, in some ways is a is a relatively new um phenomenon that uh, uh, took place, you say, and it, and, and it was done to basically isolate people into these silos so you could create automatons out of them because you could control them. The idea was not to have a human being who is a fully whole functioning person where mind, body, and soul were interconnected. Um, you know, the word in Tamil, which is probably one of the oldest languages on the planet, if not the oldest, um, the word Vaidir means healer and warrior. Um, the concept of fighting evil and also uh, fighting against death were one. The archetypes of St. Michael, right? Or Murugan, Karthagin, you know? Uh, you can look at these, they, they were one. You, they, they never, it was like united, right? Somewhere along the way, they literally went in and did all this very fucked up surgery to make these, uh, essentially shattered peoples uh, who they were. And so you have all these people with all sorts of fucked up personality disorders now. Because they 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 think they're supposed to be in these one little realms, and it's not. They've disconnected the human being. So this is a central part of um, how the elites do this, and they and they consciously do this because Dramatic ultimately personality shattering. Yeah, and then the goal is to uh, ultimately make people machines who serve a finite set of people. And you can make people machines when you reduce them. It's called reductionism, right? When you don't enable people to see themselves as a whole being. We all have these infinite capabilities within us. We're not just any one thing. You have artistic capabilities. You have engineering capabilities. You have mathematical capabilities. Uh, we're philosophers. We're all these things. That's a whole human being. It's a, it's, a, it's a much more deeper and richer journey that life's supposed to be about. But only booby fucking Kennedy can run for office. Right? Trump, who's never really run any business, a fake businessman. Right? Or Vivek the Snake, who comes out of nowhere. Joe Biden, you can go down the list. These people are all just owned. They're all slaves. That's what's important to understand. All of these people are slaves and they want to make us slaves. They want to keep us on the plantation because fundamentally they hate everyday people because we have the opportunity to be complete whole human beings and they're not because they've sold their souls. And that's where, uh, uh, that's the awakening that needs to take place. And that's what we're doing with Truth, Truth Freedom Health. We teach people these fundamental system science con concepts. We go down to the root of the solution and the problem. And I was fortunate to be able to uncover these principles because when you take modern engineering science and you 
look at ancient systems of yoga and medicine, you find out there's a core missing link, the connection between what may seem be very diverse things. Engineers have to deal with reality. We have to build shit. You know, we can't sort of bullshit our way through stuff. We have to build stuff. You have to deal with the reality of what you see. Ancient systems of yoga and medicine were like that because the ancient rishis were actually engineers. And what I uncovered was that the ancient systems of yoga and medicine, the language that they used to describe anything around them and inside of us was exactly the same as the you know key principles that come out of general control system theory or general system theory. And that at the core helps us educate pretty much everyone in very, very simple ways. You don't have to be a nerd. And that's also an innovation. We've made it accessible to everyone. And our model is learn, teach, and serve. So with that knowledge, the words truth, freedom, health are not a slogan. Freedom is about the transport process that occurs in general systems theory, which is a movement of information, matter, and energy. Truth is really a conversion process. Truth is not just a, ver a noun, it's a process. It comes from applying the scientific method, gathering data, refining it. The truth that you know today of Newtonian mechanics gets refined when you start looking at things like the speed of light. It's not Newton was wrong, it gets refined, right? And keeps going like that. And so truth is really a process, conversion. And health is a vessel which contains truth and freedom. In general systems theory, we call it the storage principle. Now in the Indian systems of ancient medicine and, and yoga, they called it vath, pith, and kaf. Same thing. So these principles are what I've uncovered, exist everywhere. So once you teach people this, they can really, really reflect on this and then become alchemists in a sense. You know, they can start realizing that we have tremendous capabilities to change this world. And collectively, we haven't even scratched what it means to be a full human being. And this is why it's very important to get off this plantation. And this is why I use such hard wor harsh words as Zionist cocksucker. Because it is a very, very important word because MIT PhD supposedly aren't supposed to say that word, but you must say that word because these words describe the level of depravity that the leaders of the United States have come to. They suck Zionist cock all day. They don't want to talk about, on the one hand, think about it, Booby Kennedy runs a for-profit organ, nonprofit called Children's Health Defense Fund, but he's absolutely fine obliterating the children in Palestine. Doesn't think about it. And people live with these contradictions because people have been tuned, unfortunately, to think that contradictions are okay. Your personal integrity does not have to match your public integrity. And Booby Kennedy says that, brainwashes people. That's the devil's words. Your personal integrity doesn't have to meet your public integrity. What the fuck are you talking about? How can people accept that? The unfortunate thing is people have given way too much respect to the word Kennedy, right? to these, these folks who are exploiters. Um, and, you know, they deserve a, a good lashing of sorts, you know? And I can do it with my tongue and the the fact that we have some access, which is highly, highly censored, by the way. It's, it's literally a digital cage, which we also exposed. But anyway, our movement is founded on this deep reverence for these ancient science, um, scientific principles, which have existed. You know, science doesn't go just exponentially like this. It's a cycle. There have been civilizations which have come and gone over time um, and probably goes back to infinity, you know? Um, and we will come and go, you know? Hopefully one day we'll really realize what it means to be fully human. Um, but this has been sort of the big contradiction that uh, people deal with. Um, and I think we've made a pretty significant way forward in the uncovering of this knowledge that links modern engineering principles with ancient science. So that's at the core of it. Now, my running for president, you know, if you look at even our bumper sticker, we encourage people to get one of these because when you get one of these bumper stickers, it's not, it, and you put it actually on your car, it's much more than sort of mentally masturbating or talking about running for president because the, you know, we have what, about two, three million followers on all these social media. But since I was put back on Twitter, They've just stayed the same. Facebook, 520,000 views for like three years, okay? YouTube, you know, 20 million minutes of viewing, not one new subscriber. And this is the game that they play because in my, you know, historic lawsuit in 2020 where we exposed the censorship infrastructure long before Fucker Carlson 
did the limit limited hangout, right? We did it. And they had to suppress our revealing the news because they don't want independent people like us getting the limelight. So they have to bring in fucker Carlson. Same thing what you were saying, Raphael, and the whole, you know, the issue with COVID. I was the first scientist to talk about it. We were not only talk about it, but expose it in March of 2020 and then give a solution, which is vitamin C, you know, quercetin, zinc, vitamin D3, which Zelenko had essentially stole and bottled. But we gave it away. We saved hundreds of millions of people's lives. And you can go. I didn't see Peter McCullough there. I didn't see all these clowns in March of 2020. In 1993, 1994, you know, after I'd read Duisburg's work, I was the first one in my MIT class. You know, when we started discussing systems biology, virology, I said, you know, John Duisburg says that, you know, the um, connection between HIV and AIDS uh, violates Koch's postulates. And everyone said, what are you talking about? The guy in the front of the classroom was teaching. It was a guy by the name of John Essigman. John's one of the leading guys in immunology. He said, you know, Shiva's actually telling something quite profound because I have great respect for Duisburg. And um, uh, HIV does not, in fact, follow Koch's postulates. You see, that was, Jesus, 30 years ago. Where the fuck was all these other people talking about it well, now? Well, Fauci was around back then. Well, Fauci was the one. Robert Gallo, at that time, G-A-L-L-O, um, there was a, you can go to, uh, look this up in the front page of New York Times. He was found uh, to do fraudulent work on HIV. So HIV is a quote unquote a virus. And over here is AIDS, which is acquired immune deficiency syndrome, which is basically your T cell count goes down, you know, to 70 or less, right? So Gallo and others put forward this nonsense that HIV caused AIDS, billions of dollars went into it. Um, the Nixon administration, uh, there he is, yep. Um, and uh, his work was proven to be fraud. And who came to his rescue was Fauci. I remember my sister's a medical doctor and I saying, look, HIV does not cause AIDS. It violates Koch's postulates, okay? She said, no, 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 you're crazy. Anyway, 10 years later, she said, you know, you're right. And if you saw 10 years later, they started calling it um, uh, you know, age related diseases. Okay. Very clever in their messaging. So, you know, the reality is tuberculosis, they pretty much shown they've isolated it. You inject it into something, you can cause TB. Okay. So that follows Koch's postulates. So you can't th throw out everything because now you have grifters. Oh yeah. Do you believe in virus or not? Well, where the fuck were you in 2020? I didn't see you saying anything. All of these medical doctors, Malothra, you know, uh, who's this other fool with the beard? You know, they got him pushing him out there. I didn't see any of these guys out there in 2020. Booby Kennedy was promoting lockdowns. Trump was promoting lockdowns. So anyone looking for leaders, you got to look at what did you say? When did you say it? And what purpose was it? Was it to mobilize people or disarm people? I started the Fire Fauci campaign. In the middle of all the other shit I was doing, we took our rickety old bus and we collected 120,000 signatures, went to the White House, delivered it to Trump. He didn't do shit. I didn't see Kennedy. Kennedy literally stole all my material and writes the real Anthony Fauci. He's a fucker. He is created by the deep state. He exists because of the deep state. His family is a bunch of fucking gangsters. You know, one wing of the establishment knocks another wing of the establishment off and we're supposed to feel sorry for them. What are you supposed to do? Feel sorry for Vito Corleone, you know, because he got bumped off by whatever the Tagazzi family, whatever the hell it is, you know, and Godfather, right? This is what people, this is what they got people doing. They're all fucking gangsters. So we have to raise our consciousness and understand these folks do not give a fuck about you. Why are the, why the fuck are you giving a fuck about them? But when it comes to truth, fucker Carlson is their latest deep state ally. The guy never tells the truth of when it needs to be said. He waits. His family is all CIA. He's CIA. He's as deep state as you can get. So they have a cabal now that they've created. Joe Rogan, Alex Jones, Fucker Carlson, Donald Trump, Vivek the Snake. If you notice in all these doctors who claim they're fighting COVID, the wellness company, they're all sort of aggregating, but they're, they're really the neo-establishment. And concomitantly, they're creating the opposers to them, the fake, 
attackers like the Candace Owens, you know, who's, you know, I mean, she's a media whore. Come on. Now, when it's in vogue to talk against Zionism, she will. But not really, you say. Not about ending the occupation of the United States. So they have it down to a science. But our movement, the work that I do, exposes this so people understand the system's dynamics of this. So they can liberate themselves. So that's where we are. Telling, you know, wearing a hat that says truth, truth social, is bullshit. When did you fucking tell the truth? Have you ever told the truth at the right time when it mattered? That's a question we need to elevate people's consciousness to ask now. Um, and moreover, these people aren't really very interested in real science. They're not, they want to separate science and spirituality in a fundamental way. When um, these systems were never separated um, in any, you know, ancient systems, you know, they were always integrated. Um, they were fully understood uh, as, you know, the transition from information, matter, and energy. It was a free flow, right? Between information, matter, and energy, whatever you wanted to call that. Divine uh, principles, matter conforming to divine principles, something like that. Well, information, Claude Shannon is, so, so this is what happened, um, Andreas. You know, if you go to the modern history of the last 400 years, when Newton identified the equations of motion, by the way, it was identified long before him. There's a lot of data that, you know, he stole it from others, you know. But anyway, um, let's call it, quote unquote, Newtonian mechanics. When that was he shared. found it in a book. Huh? Was found that? It, he found it in a book. Exactly. Yeah. Found it in a book. And, he, and, and you can see there's something so concomitant between Vasco da Gama going to India you know, 14, 1500s and so much stuff coming out by the Renaissance, you know, um, it's, it's all just stolen shit for shit out of India. It's a fact. Brown guys did it, but you know, it's, it's hard. You get people. very majestic. I like that. Keep going. That? You can be very majestic. I like that. Exactly. Yeah. So when Newton quote unquote shared these findings, it proposed him. Now he left out something you see, because he left out the other baby with the bathwater, but he shared the mechanistic view of the world, right? That time moved backward and forward in this mechanistic view. You could predict the motions of things, which means you could predict the motion of you and me, right? And from that point, the trajectory of that mechanistic view brings us to today, where social media people think they are going to gather all this data on you and me, and they can mechanistically describe you and me, what we're going to do next, predictively. They can do predictive analytics. So with that knowledge, this worldview emerges that you can manipulate the world. You can control it and channel it. So if I take all of Dr. Shiva Adre's followers and I find all of his followers' profiles of some variables of, let's say, 3,000 3, variables, I can develop a multidimensional vector space. And then I can predict the trajectory of who will follow him and then use that to find potential other followers of his and then drive messages of Booby Kennedy to divert attention from him. That's called a, a censorship in a much more powerful way than that has ever been done before. That's what's going on now. But that comes from that mechanistic view. That comes that from system is, sciences. Well, it's, it's a mechanistic view. It's not system science. It's actually a reductionist view of assuming everything in the universe is mechanistic. You see? Now, the ancient systems of science integrated this mechanistic view, which was very localized under certain conditions, with a non-mechanistic view, okay? So I'll give you, so in, in, two, in 1957, Ilya Prigioni won the Nobel Prize, I believe in physical chemistry. He was the first one to resolve this contradiction because in the 1800s, this mechanistic view came into contradiction with the laws of thermodynamics, which said that everything goes to the highest state of entropy to disorder. So if everything is mechanistically organized, why do we have beautiful, quote unquote, round planets? Why is everything so predictable? Because that shouldn't really exist. If you have a worldview of the second law of thermodynamics, which says everything goes to its natural state of disorder, this didn't make sense. Boltzmann tried to, um, try to um, address this contradiction and he was sort of poo-pooed. It was not until the work of Prigioni you know, and, you know, Claude Shannon in the 20s and 30s, he's the one who proposed the concept that information is negative entropy, right? It's organized because 
information is organized. It's, it's, it's the opposite of entropy, right? It's organized energy, right? Um, and then Prigioni, who doesn't get a lot of credit, unfortunately, he was he grew up in Russia in 1917, but he was the first one who was concerned with this very fundamental problem. And he did a wonderful, uh, he pointed out a wonderful experiment that had been done with chemical clocks. And I've shared this before, and the experiment goes like this. Imagine you take a big room, imagine that room is a cube um, filled with, uh, and you and I and, and Raphael are outside of that, and someone puts in a shitload of ping pong balls, white ping pong balls, and you have a fan that could swirl them. The room would look white, right, from the outside. If people just took out those and they put in black, the room would look black. What happens when you mix them all together? Where entropy states, it should look like a sort of a gray color, right? And it should be, it should stay there forever. But under certain conditions, this is what's fascinating. Under certain conditions, what he noticed was the, the room would go into these zebra shaped conditions. What was called a chemical clock would be black, white, black, white, black, white stripes, or in this direction. This should not be happening, it was order emerged out of chaos. Yeah. Okay, so that order was a mechanistic world for that temporal time, you say, which is what this world is at a certain point, and it'll go back into chaos. So it's called an emergent property. So this resolves this fundamental issue between science and religion, because the reality is, if we are conscious human beings, a thought that you have today on one part of the universe could, and, and what Prigioni described it was that the particles were communicating to each other. Now, we don't know how this happens. And that's what's quite fascinating. How do these particles communicate to each other? So that means one being raising his or her consciousness in one part of the world may affect another being halfway around the universe. And so this is quite profound. And so we can create these emerging, emergent phase transitions, which you know, in system and revolution, I call that a revolution. So I define what a revolution is. A revolution is a phase transition when you create a self-organizing system. So our movement understands this and our goal is to raise consciousness. The more we fucking hammer at booby fucking Kennedy and call these people Zionist cocksuckers, why is this guy calling them a Zionist cocksucker? That's an awful word. You shouldn't use words like that. Yeah, why shouldn't I use words like that? You lead to that question. Why am I using words like that? Why did I use get off the plantation? Well, now you're going to have to do some soul searching. Or do you want to be an automaton and say, why are you using words like that in a reactionary way? You see, so these opportunities, these educational opportunities that we're creating, why don't you get on the ground and help us collect some signatures? Why don't you go hand out a flyer? Have you ever done that? Or have you just been behind a machine all day? Have you ever gone in front of a Walmart and said hello to someone and tried to hand a flyer and have a discussion with them with your eyes meeting theirs? No, you haven't. What happens when you do that? Well, you become very vulnerable. You have to talk to them, okay? You can't be like, you know, smart all the time. You have to figure out the right words, right? So these are musculature in people, musculatures in people's body that haven't been exercised. And those in power want us not to exercise our societal capabilities and be human. And so that's what we're doing. Um, and... I think it's quite interesting to observe and it, it, is that uh, I'm probably the most shadow banned guy out there. You know, when I was put back on Twitter in 2022, Elon Musk thought I'd go suck his whatever off. Right. And what I noticed was the first tweet I did since, you know, I was thrown off Twitter for exposing the backdoor portal into Twitter in my federal election campaign. And when he and when he supposedly became the free speech guy, all these conservatives started bowing to him. And then he brings in Linda Yaccarino. What they're he, selling, and they're selling uh, Twitter data. That's like the big thing. That's all screen. they're doing. Yeah, they're, they're selling, selling Twitter data to the, the secret, like to the to the NSA. Well, yeah. I mean, if you look at this diagram here, I mean, this is what was uncovered in our lawsuit. Okay, this is a woman that threw me off Twitter, the general counsel, and she used this infrastructure that I uncovered. This is 2022. All right. Wow. It, all right. All of this is in our lawsuit. We uncovered this, not this fucking douchebag, Mike Benz, who fucker puts on. OK, stealing. I mean, this is hard day's work, man. That's like a third Ph.D. We discovered the entire architecture in 2020. My lawsuits I did by myself. I'm not a lawyer. My lawsuits were so well written 
that the opposition, Twitter's general counsel, said, I didn't write those. You see, because most lawyers do not want to take the government on. Lawyers, they don't fight for you. They'll, you know, they'll do business contracts. They do not want to take the government. The judge wanted me to just go on Twitter in 2020 and drop my case against the government. I refused. And then they flipped. But I'm going after them against ISA. This is long, four years before fucker Carlson even talked about it. In fact, I wrote to him. I have all the emails. He concealed it. Glenn Greenwald concealed it. Because they do not want independent people who are off the plantation getting the limelight for doing the hard work. They steal our stuff because they want to keep people connected to the establishment. So anyway, it's a, it's a good thing that you guys, you know, are thinking about these things. And that's why I like directly working with independent media because, and talking to people in different audiences. And that's sort of the strategic decision we made, because if I go on fucker Carlson, first of all, he's never going to put me on because he'll lose all of his audience. Joe Rogan won't. Joe Rogan follows me. Booby Kennedy sends his minions and they literally steal our material. Word for word, man. Declare your independence is our slogan. You can see it since 2018. So this is what the swarm does. They do not want independent, truly independent movements coming. And they know they're coming. And so in retaliation for that, they replicate us. That's why when you talk about the well wellness company, are you fucking serious? You're not the wellness company. You waited, waited. And it's a CIA technique called a limited hangout. You heard that word? I'm sure you guys have. A limited hangout is a technique that came out of the Nixon era where you know that um, the big truth is going to come out. So you titrate the release of it half truths. And then you own the truth. And then you do movies and Oscar award winning things to act like you're the ones who released it. And then you just hope it goes away. So I think that's what, relevant to Stellium's question there. Yeah. Just because what, mentioned limited yeah I'd like to know if he thinks we've landed on the moon. Look, um, <laughs> I think what needs to happen, uh, by the way, there's a movie coming out. I was just, I don't know if you know, someone's doing a movie about this. Have you seen this? Like a mainstream movie. Really? Yeah. They, well, they're probably, it's the elite. Is it the Illuminati movie for, film? Usually it's, again, like you just said, like a soft disclosure thing. Yeah. So, so yeah, they're doing Basically, a everything I've seen, just so I want to say for a second, like I've been seeing what kids' movies are now, and anything made for someone born after like 1999, it's, it's like in Legos, it's assumed that the moon landing was faked for all children. Like they're all just taught that now. Well, look. I think the issue is this. Um, since 1970, there was an act called the Mansfield Amendment, which was passed. Okay. So there was a shitload of money that used to be just given away to scientists to do just basic research. You know, and they would do what, really great research. Like they there weren't any strings attached to it. I don't know if you have that up. Yeah. So if you read about the Mansfield Amendment, what's interesting about it is um, even though if you look at the military budget, there was a little piece of it, which they just said, we don't give a fuck. We're just going to give it away to some guy in AT Bell Lab, some guy. To, and they didn't tie that scientist down. It was sort of contradictory, right? That guy could do any, you know, so he was in some basement doing wild stuff and people left him alone. Then what happened was after the Vietnam War, the understanding was, okay, we don't want military research. Only research for the military could be used for basic research. So the two organizations, the NIH and the NSF, the National Science Foundation, the NIH, which by the way, if you are, let's say both you guys get your PhD and you're on the academic path. So you go join University A and B, they give you seven years to get tenure. Ten years, basically after tenure, you can basically do whatever the hell you want. You know, you, you get paid a full salary as a tenured professor, but to get tenure, how do you get tenure? You have to write papers and you have to bring in grant money into your universities. And if you bring grant money and you write papers and your papers are heralded by the others in your particular specific area as great research, then you get tenure. It's sort of, you have to ask his to your people and they say your research is good. You say their research is good. There's really no innovation. 
So what, what ended up happening with the Mansfield Amendment is when um, it basically moved this what was a relatively small amount of money in the military budget to the NSF and NIH, which controlled it under the executive branch. So research became highly politicized, scientific research, innovation research, you see? And it started around the Kennedy's time. You see that this the rumblings were going on. This is why Eisenhower sort of gave that speech, right? About the military industrial academic complex. He actually said military industrial complex. His original speech said military industrial academic complex, Jay Stratton, who was on the White House Council, was a professor, who was a president at MIT, took out that word academic. So it was originally a triangle. Military it was implied, you know. It's, <laughs> what's that? It's implied. Obviously. Yeah, but it was explicit in the speech. <laughs> right. Um, William Fulbright, at a at a talk that he gave at a state university, brought it back. Okay, because it was all these p three people involved, these three entities. But what ended up happening was the NIH and the NSF became highly, highly political organizations. So when science became politicized, anything becomes possible. Moon landings could be faked or not. You know what I'm saying? Uh, viruses could exist or not exist. AIDS could be related. Everything took place because the academics became the oldest profession on the planet. Okay? Prostitutes of science. Most of these academics are not that bright. You know, it took me a while after my undergraduate year at MIT to realize that like, a lot of these professors were not that bright at MIT. They got there by sucking somebody's what off, okay? And playing the game, following the rules, going down like an automaton. I do my PhD, I write papers and I do this, then I do this and I do this. They weren't that bright guys. That's a conclusion I came to. And that may seem quite arrogant, but it's what well, I observed. It's, there it's were, a current news relation, but maybe you've heard on social media is blowing up with this, the current scandals, let's say in the entertainment industry and all the stories going around there. And just also there, it seems not all the greatest heralded artists actually can even necessarily write a single line of a bar or a lyric, just like with some programmers that are the most relevant and known today, maybe can't even write a single line of code. Yeah. Actually. I mean, I mean, what's interesting is several about last year, a guy called Kanye West calls me. Okay. And um, this one of our guys who knew about me and Kanye says, Dr. Shiva, I want to work with you. I want to learn everything you're doing. And so I said, Kanye, you need to, I think he was thinking of running for president. I said, Kanye, you don't know anything about politics. Why don't you actually learn it and study it? Come down here and, you know, we'll teach you system science. You know, you can actually understand. So he said, okay, okay, I'm going to get my private plane. I'll be there. I said, okay. And then he cancels. Okay. And then he calls me up, a long conversation. He goes, I want to understand everything you're doing because I'm going to plagiarize all of it. You know, Jay-Z taught me how to rap. Da, 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 da. You could see the level of insecurity in this individual, right? Had never, it was all these people. I mean, I used to live out in Hollywood, used to be married to someone out there. And what I learned was that 99% of these people aren't even trained. They didn't put in their chops to learn anything. They just were at the right location at the right time, pure luck. There's a thousand other people who could have gotten their job. And so they're highly insecure because they know it was pure fucking luck and they have no fucking talent. So that insecurity rages through them and they are so scared shitless about that, someone will uncover that, that they hate people with actual talent, you see? And they're about plagiarizing work. It is the norm. And when I, literally walked away from all that one day, a very interesting lawyer. She said, Shiva, do you know you saved your life? These people are vultures. They'll just steal your shit because they need content. They're like vampires. So yeah, you're absolutely right, Raphael. <laughs> they, none of these people, they, you know, and the few that have talent have to remain in their lane. You know, very, very, very famous uh, actor that is a household name. He said, Shiva, you know, five families control all of us. So these people are fucking slaves, guys. And because Hollywood is a slave, because academia is a slave, and this is why you have the lifespan going like this. I'm the only one, when I launch my campaign, if people go to Shiva for president, you can download a flyer. It is the foundations of our campaign because it intersects truth, freedom, and health. Since 1980, the US lifespan is going like this. It's not just the vaccines. This has been going on, it's a systemic issue attack on working people. It's an attack, the income inequality, the stress, the chem, it's a whole bunch of things. 
John Kennedy started it with the 1962 Vaccination Act. His brother, the other fucking Kennedy, protected all the pharma companies, Ted Kennedy. And then this fool, booby fucking Kennedy, acts like he's fighting against the corruption. But he says, I'm going to create safe vaccines. Really? The guy can't create anything except, you know, problems and get, you know, problems where his wife wants to hang herself, right? Do you have thoughts on that, though, in terms of fa safe vaccines? I mean, obviously, like, you're a scientist and you are you believe in pragmatic solutions. Do you believe in um, adenoviral transhumanism? And, you know, can we move forward in that in any way? Or how do you well, feel? This is, okay, so this is, they're asking a good question, Rafael. So if you step back and you have to ask yourself, there's infinite states that we could end up in. It's considered infinite, okay? We could end up in a, in a world where you apply this highly capitalist model of existence, okay? This imperial model, everything driven by power, profit, and maximization of power, profit, and control, okay? And if you follow that all the way through, it's gonna end up in a very dystopian world where it'll be a mechanized world where you will, um, because it's about maximizing profit. Why do you need all these human beings? Why do you need so many human beings is where that leads to. Why, why can't 500,000 people own the planet and it'll make it our oasis? When that model, you have machines running it, you have a, you have a finite, amount, right? That's what that leads to because it's about max. That's the modus operandi. So now if the mo modus operandi is truth, freedom, health, and some deep connection to something much deeper than you, okay? True consciousness and exploring that, that's going to end up in a very different world. It may not even require this much technology, right? We may choose to forego technology, certain technologies. We may choose in a very conscious way. Well, we don't want to, we don't need that. Okay. I don't need, yeah, I can create all this, but I don't need that. Like you make this much deeper decision to say, we're going to use technology as we need it. Right now, that is a very, very powerful position to be in. You say, but that requires the broad mass of people creating a world that serves all of our interests versus a 0. 0.00001. Now, is that world destined to come into being? Nope. It depends on if we fight for it. If there's an awakening to do that. So there used to be this thesis that if the world gets worse and worse and worse, workers will arise, right? Workers unite. Well, it's not, it's not true. Because the more oppression you cause, you create decay in the human spirit. And you could actually lead to greater oppression. That is why during these points of history, like right now, we should be studying this. We should be understanding how we create movements, the science, the physics, and that's what we're doing. It's it, When the shit hits the fan, it's like, oh, we're suddenly going to rise up. No, you're going to have total fascism. You won't have the time to organize. You won't have the time to deliberate and talk. And so we live in a very luxurious time right now. And people need to use it wisely. So... That's why, you know, I, I think it's very important to understand where we are, you know, um, and heroes meet history. History is going to move a certain wave. So, for example, consider COVID um, 2020. OK, imagine if the movement for truth, freedom, health that already existed in 2016. When COVID came, it wouldn't have just been me in 2020 speaking up. It would have been 500 other people with that same articulation. You see, it would have been game, set, match over. This is why, just like we have civil engineers, electrical engineers, um, nuclear physicists, we have to train revolution engineers, people who understand the physics of change. It's not just going to happen from good ideas. Everything around us has not just happened. It's been conscious thought, information, compelled by action, moved by experience. You see, there's this triangle of consciousness leads to a certain kind of action, Action gives you the experience and the experience you raise your consciousness. And it's this process. Um, so if you, you know, the people who govern us reflect the state of consciousness. On that note, I mean, do you think yeah. the elite have, uh, so, uh, you know, you've heard about like, Ep there's all these conspiracies like Epstein cloning, you know, trying to put, get together money for like cloning and, you know, clone aid um, celebrities talking about clone. Do you think that, that the elite have the capacity for more than they're releasing to the public and how much more, or are they just so inept, you know, that they can't even get like mm -hmm. North enslaved Indians and North Koreans outsourced to do it for them. I mean, right. What's well, an interesting thing, you know, many, many years ago, this is in 1970, 
a friend of mine who was working for one of these chip manufacturers was saying that Air Force from you know way up above could read the keyboard electromagnetic and figure out what people were saying. That's in 1970, okay? Totally. All right, so if that's true, there is probably, I don't think it's inconceivable that there's a whole body of technology that has fully not been released, right? To the public, right? And that it is titrated or may never be released. It's preserved for certain strata people. And you, you could, you know, you could conclude that um, because if you assume the motivation here is maximization of profit, maximization of power, maximization of control. So why would you want to release certain things, right? You titrate the release. But at the same time, I think Rafael and Andres, I do also believe the reason I use the word swarm is this is not a homogeneous situation. The elites have their own contradictions because of their rabid greed. One, you know, it's like those pit of vipers. One viper may bite another viper, right? One gangster may want to knock off another. Remember, these people, uh, thieves don't really have that much lo loyalty among themselves. So whatever they do, the point is we can't do much about it. The issue is what are we going to do? And that's what my life has been dedicated to because of where I came from, you know, intersecting my own um, suffering, right? Intersecting my own journey with the collective that leads me to conclude we have to uncover what the principles are to shatter the swarm. And then we have to go boldly on our own and forge our own paths. Yeah, is it guaranteed? We're, no, but I surely can tell you waiting for them to do anything shit's not gonna happen. And surely by outsourcing our stuff to fucking Trump or Booby Kennedy, are you fucking serious? These people are our fucking enemies. So like another thing I'm seeing is all these, you know, a lot of the media about AI, you know, yeah. it's is negative, right? It seems like it was positive up until it started being useful for replacing CEOs. And exactly. And that so how do you feel about that? I mean, like, is well, it is it possible that I could just do a bunch of people have act, you know, removed the gateway if people can use AI or is that here's true? the deal, right? Remember, any technology by in and of itself is not good or bad. It's who controls it, who controls the means of production of that technology. If you look at the arc of all technology, when it's driven by maximizing power, profit and control, it always consolidates and gets used against a broad mass of humanity. You know, when the concept of the, the pu printed publishing came, right? Printing press. The sword um, and the butter knife. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, it originally came out that it was going to help us all, but eventually four major publishing companies came. You want to get a book out. It's not going to get out there. Booby fucking Kennedy wants to get a book and get it out. It's over everywhere, right? So how the fuck does that happen? You look at the internet. You know, when I wrote many years ago, 1993, I wrote Arts and the Internet. And Glenn Urban, who was dean of the Sloan School, you know, wrote the forward to it. And I was saying, wow, because he, he's a sculptor and I do a lot of art. And I say, wow, the internet could really help artists who didn't have to have to bang their gallery owner all the time to get you know a gig, right? And that's what goes on. Um, they're gatekeepers. So you could go direct. And the internet was proceeding during that, when the web, I mean, to be specific, during 1993 to around 1999. And you built your own website, you promoted it. It was all very um, a, a cottage industry. But then Silicon Valley and the VCs came in and they supported Facebook and YouTube and a few companies and everyone stopped doing their own work. They started homesteading with these guys. So now we have the consolidation of the internet with three or four major providers and you have greater censorship than ever before, right? It's the flip side. So you look at AI, obviously, I mean, AI could be used by each one of us in very powerful, creative ways. You could, in many ways, replicate your ideas and instantiate it in a machine, which you could do probably more productive work than ever before. But the issue is, will it be used for that? I doubt it. It's going to be used not to advance 8 billion of us to do the work of, I don't know, 10 trillion of us. Imagine the creativity that could come out. It's going to be used to make sure a few create fucked up technologies for themselves, right? It's it's going to create a dystopian world the way it's headed, right? It's not. So that's why I'm saying I believe fundamentally at the heart of it, working people, people actually produce. I believe value 
does start at the point of production. And Marx was right about this. Marx got a lot of things right. He was, you know, and you have to give it to this guy. He understood these phase transitions. He understood certain aspects of system science. Um, he may not have known that because he, the science didn't exist at the time. But the point of working people, organizing themselves to own their destiny is, is a very powerful thing. And since the 1970s till today, again, the academic elites have done everything they can to make sure to bamboozle young people in the colleges to make sure they stay far away from building movements, that they get involved in some type of nihilism. You see, this is by design. And that's the, the that's where we're at today, um, that there was an actual effort made by the humanities de departments to make sure they started teaching people wackadoodle shit to divide all of us, right? And that's where we're at today, not to have intellects really talking about this issue of how do you build movements? And so I've had to do that. And the fortunate thing is our movement exists now, you know? And um, I think we have a huge opportunity. It's just gonna be a matter of time at this point on the level of people that actually wanna get trained and engaged and move forward. So I'm actually quite optimistic. It's just interesting thinking about, you know, the unreasonable effectiveness of uh, pure mathematics and na natural sciences and how you're talking about the different, you know, you can see when that became a famous or a popular thought in academia, that that created this post-truth wackadoodle movement, as you're saying, because it became about mechanistic reality as opposed to emergent truth. Exactly. I think you, I think, I, I think you said it perfectly. Yeah, I think I think in eight, yeah, so that's what it's about, Andres. They do not want people to believe that their thoughts, they're raising their consciousness can move the world. That's true hu humanity. You know, when I, I keep referring to this, when Columbus came to the new world, if you haven't seen his diary, you should go read it. It's up online. And he said, you know, he was given a charter. I forget how many miles of land that he saw that became his. Right. It basically had ownership. Right. And he sees these Native Americans and they live together. You know, they're the, they bring him food, well, anything he wants. And he goes, you know, with, he goes, these are truly the children of God. They give willingly of everything that they have. And then he ends by saying with 50 good men, I could control and subjugate all of them. You say? So this concept of human nature being greedy and wanting to subjugate other things, this is something that's promoted heavily in academic circles. So really fucked up because a human mind, the human spirit is in many ways plastic. It's highly, it can have infinite possibilities. You can become a really devilish human being. You can become absolutely evil, right? Even the Christian tradition, if you look at it, and this is a contradiction, a lot of Christians do not know how to discuss. I said, okay, um, yes, I'm a born again Christian. Great. Okay. Wonderful. So What's your goal? Well, I, I've repented. I'm, I can't wait to go to heaven. Great. And what happens when you go to heaven? Well, it's a beautiful place. It's perfect. You know, everyone's loving and kind and beautiful. I said, okay, so it's absolute perfection, right? Yeah, no bad thoughts. Okay, then explain to me why Lucifer is in heaven and he wants to annihilate God. Where did that thought come from? <laughs> Where did his evilness come from if he's in heaven? Oh, well, uh, well, oh, then they, oh, well, the angels are allowed choice. Okay. So what you're talking about is consciousness now. It's not a physical place. We're talking about consciousness. And consciousness can go up or down. Nothing is guaranteed. So in the ancient traditions of spirituality, when a great spiritual being comes to this world, this earthly world, they actually make great sacrifices because they can also go downward in consciousness. So the issue is consciousness is what it's about. Are we moving it forward? and refining it, it's really more refinement, or are we going in other directions? So consciousness is, to me, what it's about. And I think what I've uncovered with the work I've done is this link between, in a very practical way, how people can understand consciousness, you say, by linking these two great traditions, engineering system science, which is very, very grounding, and these ancient systems of yoga and medicine. And when you put them together, you have a framework that can guide people without this woo-woo stuff, right? In a very tangible way. And it gives, you have to be political. You have to be religious or whatever, spiritual. 
You have to be conscious of your health. You have to be a fighter. You can't be just any one thing. You have to be all those things. So that's where we're at, you know? And I think um, because this movement exists now, um, and it's all over the world now, but our goal is not to convince people, Andres and Rafael, it's more to support people when they get to a point where they really want to uncover things, right? When they, and then to also give people inspiration that a nihilistic view thinking you cannot do anything and revealing truth without mobilization, revealing truth and saying it when it's late is part of the evil here that's going on. So as you, you're talking about that movement, maybe you want to share in which places, for example, it exists. And also since you have properly investigated and understand systems theory, I was always wondering, obviously now, let's just say in a sense, the brand or movement you're creating by definition would already be potentially a single point of failure, let's say. What are the tools or the systems and methods you employ to ensure that basically you can move forward both with your campaign and with all of these organizations, because too often, as you know very well, things get infiltrated. I've heard of different, apparently truly independent individuals, someone trying to build something in Canada, for example, which also then got infiltrated when it started to become effective. So I'm curious, do you have any safeguards or what are your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a it's a great question, Raphael. So think about it this way. First of all, um, none of this stuff just... First of all, none of this stuff just happens, okay? Because you're bringing up a good point. Things don't just happen. You have to you have to build these things. I keep saying the iPhone just didn't happen, right? This book I just didn't write. Oh, I just want to write a book. I'm just going to sit here and smoke weed. My book is going to appear. No, you have to write this thing. You have to put it together. You have to put an outline. I mean, this is negative entropy, okay? It's information, right? This is negative entropy. It's organized energy and matter, right? So we have to recognize that we have to organize these things. And then if you're going to organize stuff, then you have to have organizing principles, which means goes back to what are those scientific principles based on? So our movement is fundamentally based on engineering systems principles, which I can teach to anyone now. If you get system and revolution, you can just read one chapter, but it took me a long time to write. If you watch that swarm video, you can learn a lot. So the goal is to produce content and information that people learn and have what's called a dual pedagogy model. It's a model where you can teach someone and they can teach someone and by teaching they learn, okay? So we've created that whole model of pedagogy, all right? So that's one. The other thing is um, there has to be this constant process of vigilance and educating people why you must articulate against the not so obvious establishment. So there's a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I'm for medical freedom now, right? You've seen them, right? All these wellness people. But none of them will take an ax to booby fucking Kennedy. That's a litmus test. You see, if you are actually for something, you must draw a clean, clean line and separate the wheat from the chaff. So if you stay silent on exposing Trump and you're talking about election fraud and fighting the establishment, well, something's off with you. You must expose these people, especially if you're an influencer. So we set litmus guidelines, right? Like very clear ones. So there's some woman um, that, I said, oh yeah, she's a big medical freedom. I said, has she exposed Kennedy? No, she won't because she needs to suck off Kennedy because she needs all of his followers because she has a monetary incentive. You see, the economic incentives are where, where you can follow. The other thing, Raphael, is do people walk the walk, okay? Are they doing what they say? So you keep coming up with these ways even sincere people to push them to do stuff because it's about walking the walk, right? So we need to get on the ballot. Oh yeah, I love you, Dr. Shiva. Are you going to go help us collect signatures to get on the ballot? You see, Booby Kennedy, Donald Trump and Biden, they don't, they basically get money from the Zionists and they go hire signature vendors. They don't even have to play the game fairly. So, so Raphael, it's a series of things. It's not going to be any one thing, right? A rocket engine is not just a rocket, the rocket science is all those little things. So you support the movement. You're going to say, hey, Dr. Shiva, there's one way we need to, this we can do to make sure infiltrators don't come in. Well, that'd be a new thing we, we have to engineer, right? So it's going to be a whole bunch of things. We haven't figured it all out. 
but I'm just asking because I'm aware it's very comp it must be complex and it's must probably complex. Be continually refined to especially if it becomes larger or even to consider maybe how to duplicate it in alternate ways we are. So it we are. not so be coming back to the same you know all of the systems basic distributed network ideas yeah. we didn't even get to that electoral college system part yet either yeah so, oh. so but, but to finish up your thing our movement is now in about you know 100 plus different countries 500,000 people but we've let it develop Raphael. i didn't say okay we're going to have a top down leadership we have purposely just let it be like a soup and then we've started creating activities to see who wants to do certain things so in england the movement is really growing well a guy who's a very quiet guy michael griffith seeks him up i never you know he couldn't even use a computer that well he figured out you know you have a lot of these people are figuring stuff out so we've had to train people how to use tools, how to do project management, how to do expository writing. We've had to do stuff that the only you can go get at Harvard, you know, business school or Stanford. So we have to create all these leadership programs. It's quite fascinating. So what's happened now is our movement has a core, which is you must become a warrior scholar. You must learn how to fight and you must learn theory. That's pretty cool. So we're teaching a guy who's who's never even understood system science, system science. And, a person who cuts hair, they're understanding system science, and then they're educating a PhD uh, out of economics in Chicago. It's, it's really cool to observe this. And all these people are working people. They're not some nerds, you know, growing, you know, having their pipe and talking shit. Actual people have to go back to work, right? The other thing that we're doing is we're creating ac actionable solutions in each area. St platforms. So I'll give you an example. In 2013, um, there was a movement for raw food, okay, and clean food. Um, uh, you know, like things like kombucha, people are realizing you get more nutrients from um, foods that aren't overcooked, right? But so if you went to Whole Foods, there's all this stuff called raw, raw, raw food, but no one knew what raw meant. So I've been on various standards committees, and there's two ways standards develop in the United States. One is top down. The government says, this is our standard for organic food, da, 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 right? The other is standards emerge bottoms up, like industry groups get together. They said, hey, we're going to create a standard for blah, and then they'd go do it. And it's actually a much better standard because it's longer, but you have to bring in stakeholders. So we did that over a period of two years. I created the standard for clean food, which meant conscious living, ethical, uh, alive, and nutrient dense. And it's a much higher standard than organic or non-GMO. And then we got stakeholders. You'll see the seal on certain foods, you know. But it's it's our standard. It can change independent of me. We have public hearings. Like I give you an example, honey is very hard to find if it's organic because because the hive has to be uh, three miles away from pesticides. There are organic honey, but even if you check them from the pesticide levels, they're high. You say so. We Plus, can't now, they can't they just market genetically modified organic genetically modified corn syrup now as honey isn't that a thing now? No, because technically the USDA organic it cannot be GMO. Okay. Okay. All, All right. right. But anyway, we created a standard which has high bio. Anyway, point is, um, Andres, the standard. Um, if I want, I could share it with you guys. I don't know if you want to oh, see yeah, it. By all means. Okay? So, so this is so in the solution for food. Okay. Um, we created a standard that's by the people for the people. Okay. And, um, but what's unique about the standard is you can participate and you can help evolve the standard. Okay. You see the present button, you know, that yeah, is. Yeah. Let, let me bring that up. Okay. Cool. Um, let me go to your present and if I share a screen. Okay. So this is an actual solution we've had for many, many years now. Okay. And if you look at the standard, it's a consensus-based standard. And we have, but most importantly, the standard- I totally buy that, yeah. I've got, yeah. That, I've got that cashew butter before. Yeah, yeah, they're good guys, yeah. So what I'm saying is, but what's cool is, let me bring this up. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see this? The standards? Yeah, the standard yeah. document. Maybe, can you press control plus or make it a little bigger? Do you know what I, I uh, know No, no what I gotta do is, let me stop here. Let me stop sharing. I shared the wrong screen, okay? Okay. So if you go to the site, you can really actually, we openly publish, publish the standards document. Okay. There you go. You can share that now. Okay. Oh, sweet. Okay. So this is a document. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, man. Um, but it is the actual standards document that you can go see and anyone on the planet can get involved in this. Okay. 
It's got the actual standard of what's clean. Uh, it's based on safety, minimally processed. We have a scoring system. But my point is, this is not a government standard. Anyone listening can become part of the standards committee and say, hey, look, let's, uh, is there a standard for raw food, a raw milk, right? Eggs. We can incorporate all those, you see? So um, let me st stop. So my point is that we have created a standard, okay? I feel pretty for, good about the fact that I purchased, these are a lot of the things I get. At this oh, store. really? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. so what I'm saying is, <laughs> yeah, so you can see these have to go through a very different stringent process. And we openly put out here how much it costs, what you have to pay for it. And we made it and we hold public hearings, you see? That's pretty, I mean, like, so I get that kombucha at Costco, you know? Yeah. Like, so that's, that's awesome. I mean, so obviously it's a, it's something that can be done and it's not very, it's not more expensive than other kombuchas. So clearly it's, they're able to do it. And it's, I mean, it's not impossible. If people make it sound like it's impossible to do. No, it, it's not. And we've made this accessible, you say? So accessible, exactly. Yeah. So, so think about what we've done here. We now have a, is it perfect? No, but we can keep evolving the standard and you can participate. You can say, Hey, um, I want to get a clean raw for eggs. You can participate. What should the standard be? We put it up to vote. The public participates. So we have the standard. That's a solution for affecting the food system locally. But that's also good. So it gets into the, like the, the systems because again, we were talking about how the systems are rigged for everything else. So you're talking about running for president in this insane legal, I mean, you know, it's kind of like running against Saddam Hussein in Iraq or something in the in the 80s or 90s. It's like pretty hard to to run against the house. It's hard to win the poker game against the house if everything's rigged. But you're also talking about how you're building all these systems that are independent. Exactly, are, man. That's that's the solution right there. It's a way better solution than anything I've heard so far from anybody right. else. So so what we have um uh is that we have created my run for president gives it is itself a solution in some ways, Andres, right? We're saying, look, isn't this what a real president looks like? Right. It's a model. Comes, a guy comes bottoms up, actually does the work, actually fights for you. Right. And you just have to get over your mental hang up. Oh, well, I don't know if he can win. Well, shut the fuck up then. Look what's going on to your lives. And let me bring up this other, um, you know, in a very, uh, I think, let me see which screen is up. Let me go to this one. Okay. Which one do you have up there? Let's say you have that one. I'm not trying to figure out which screen you're showing. Okay, let me um, share this screen then. Let me stop here. I'm gonna present here. Um, I was at raw food, right? I'm gonna stay there, all right? But if you go to shivaforpresident.com, what we're doing here is if you go to the free download section, um, you have this flyer. I think you guys may have seen this, right? All right. This flyer is up there. It's open sourced. You can download this flyer. And this flyer, if you see, starts with the lesser of two evils is killing your children. And it talks about the fact that what's going on right here, right? The life's expectancy of your son or daughter is going to be less than you. Drastically. Yeah, drastically, right? But this is not something this, that just happened today. You see, the COVID people will say, oh, yeah, it's just because of the vaccine. No, it goes on here, right? For a long time. And what we're saying at the end of this is there's a way out of this. And you have to address healthcare, you have to address environment, education, innovation, governance, and economy. It's all these things that have to be addressed together. So for the environment, we have a solution. Let's go down to the food. Where is it coming from? Can we enable manufacturers to, if they're making good food, we give them a very, very good housekeeping seal of approval. That's by the people for the people. That's what clean food is. Now, when you go to healthcare, what we've done here is say, okay, um, so, you know, for years, I spent a lot of time because I grew up in an India where my grandmother was a traditional healer, and I wanted to figure out how she was able to heal. So what systems health has now become, I don't want to, you know, you have to be very careful with the medical establishment. We're not competing with the medical establishment. We're saying we've created an educational system and technology that empowers you to become a wise and intuitive leader, coach, yogi, guru. Use this system and platform to navigate and discover the right solutions for the right person at the right time. So, you know, after my Fulbright work, I created a tool and I gave it away to people. Problem is when you give away stuff, people don't use it properly. It's like a monkey getting an ultrasound machine. 
That's weird, right? Right? It's really very weird. So this tool in many ways is what my grandmother did when she looked at your face or ancient systems of medicine. So I figured out a way to visually help. Let's say Raphael could ask you a set of questions and you'll figure out your system state in this field of transport, conversion, and storage of information, matter, and energy. A different set of questions will evoke if you're in homeostasis or off, right? In the Indian system, it's called Prakriti and Vikriti, okay? In system science, we called it your natural state and your disturbed state. And the goal is you bring your body back to here and how do you do it? Well, I've taken food, medicines, yoga postures and created, made them into what are called tensors. And I can calculate which things are right for you. So our model here is to create, um, you know, the next generation of what I would call, I don't want to use the word doctors, right? But you can call leaders, coaches who will help you figure out the right solution for the right person at the right time. What's going on right now is, I'll give you an example, the health coaching world. Vidya. Huh? Vidya, I think is the word. Vidya, yeah. Vid yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the world of health coaching, the medical establishment, getting back to what you said, Raphael, the wellness charlatans. So people know the health coaching world is going to be a $30 billion industry in the next few years. So what are they doing? So the medical establishment knows people are leaving them and figuring out things on their own. Oh, I'm going to do some Reiki. I'm going to do some energy healing. I'm going to, but the problem is these, all these people are doing yoga, but yoga that they do is just Hatha yoga, which is just postures. They're not doing bhakti yoga. They're not doing, uh, the, there's multiple systems of yoga. So what's happened is as people are ripping away from the medical system, the same establishment the old, the new guard, the Hyman's and the Andrew Wiles and the Deepak Chopra, they're running now health coaching companies. But all they're doing is they're just teaching people these verbiage, giving them a certificate, but not telling them that eating raw food all day may not be right for you. Doing a ketogenic diet may, may be good for Andreas at a certain point in life. So you have all these different situations. What I have uncovered is once you take an engineering systems approach to the body, I can train you to figure out what's right for somebody else at the right time, you see, for the right situation. So that's system self. You see, we have a solution for the medical world, right? Then the other thing I've done is in the last 16 years, I've been very fascinated with medicine, you know, since I was a kid. But in 2003, when the genome project ended, we learned that we have the same number of genes as a worm. I don't know if you guys know this, right? So if we want to um, understand the body as a system, we have to move outside of the nucleus, right? Your genes don't make who you are. It's the aggregate of the genes, the interconnection the genes make with other proteins, your thoughts, the food. It's called epigenetics. All these things influence each other, okay? 26 letters, but every book is different. Exactly, man. It's the interconnections, right? I could give you 26 letters. You may connect them in very complicated ways. And Andres may just put A, B, C, D, E, G, F, G, right? He may make a simple, you know, alphabet thing that you put up in your kindergarten. That's right. So people can do different things. So the point is that it is the interconnections between the genes and proteins. Anyway, when that came, they created a field called systems biology. So in 2003, I went back to MIT and my PhD was to create a computational engine, which could, um, model all the chemical reactions in the cell. And that's what I ended up doing. So it took me 16 years to evolve that into a framework. Now we could take any disease, we could extract out the molecular pathways, put them together, compute them. And every computation is based on actual wet lab research. So it's not- Just a let, me, let me ask you, is yeah. that not also, at least to a certain extent, mechanistic? Or to what degree would you say your model at this point is refined or accurate? Because as you say, epigenetics may be a field where it may go up to the thought level. So- Yeah, so as we get you data, you can add to it. As mm -hmm. you get data, you can keep evolving it. That's what's nice about this. So for example, what we, first step we do, Raphael, we publish the map of a framework of a disease at a certain point in time. So you get a systems view of it. You say, I'll give you an example of this if I can share this again, okay? Um, I can go back to system health. So by the way, Cytosolve is here. So this is another platform. Cytosolve eliminates the need for animal testing. And so I'll give you an example. So if you guys, I'll go here, right? So 
you know, um, I am not an expert in leukemia, but using this framework, um, we published this paper recently, okay? Let me uh, bring this up. Copy link address, let me put it here, okay? Um, can I copy the link? Copy link. Copy. I'll copy link address. I got to put it here. So let me open this. So this was something we did in 18 months that no academic university could do in because they just want to get funding. But think about what we did, okay? Um, we looked at every paper that had been written in leukemia, and then we extracted out of it all uh, uh, the mechanisms. But I built the over, overall systems understanding how, how leukemia comes or develops. And this is the actual systems architecture. Can you see that, Rafael? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we did this. You know how much we got paid for this? Nothing. Okay. All these universities would have probably charged $100 million to the US government. Right. And then what we did was we open sourced it. Anyone can come look at this and we're going to enable it so people can give feedback and we can keep updating. But fundamentally, we've created now a overall systems view of how AML forms. There's three molecular processes, immune suppression, survival, and cell proliferation. These molecular, you see, but this is an engineering diagram. Biologists don't think like this. It's a layered architecture, you say? So we can then figure out interventions. I mean, don't you think academia should have done this? Right. We had I mean, to do this. This is crazy thinking about it. Oh, right. Yeah. I'll give you another example, okay? We did the same for periodontal disease, okay? So we're going after every disease and taking an engineering systems approach to it. Right, because with this, you could take, you could basically do like a Fourier transform, like to in, to triangulate between possible. You know, this is exactly what every every system should be built on this. Right. So we have what we're going to do, Andres. We're going to open source this, okay? And people can do citizen science. So here is every molecular pathway map for uh, periodontal disease, okay? And we, we make it accessible so people can read and learn this, not in gobbledygook, you know, very complex stuff. And we get it published in the leading journals. I typically go find a academic who's typically tenured and doesn't give a fuck anymore, okay? <laughs> he doesn't care that I've said Zionist cocksucker, okay? And they're pretty sharp guys, but it's hard to find these guys who are tenured and who actually want to do good work, but their own universities contain them, you see? So they're right. like elated when I come along. So we, this is the first mapping of periodontal disease. Now, using this mapping, we're going to go through every natural compound on the planet and find combinations. And I'll give you an example where we've actually done that, okay? We did this for osteoarthritis, okay? I, and we've done this for to prove how GMOs work. All of this stuff, man, we're doing it. Um, we're doing it uh, without any funding. We, well, I sponsor it myself and we citizen science it, okay? So what we want to do is we want to make this accessible to all people. So if you have a scientific question, you go be the MIT, okay? We're going to create the vehicle where you can go raise the money yourself. We'll enable the platform so you can do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, this is incredible. You, you can see now also with the... Uh like the open source AI models, right? Like how this could be used for predictive medicine. And, and there's the amount of data that could be. Well, well what we're doing, under, yeah, what we're doing under this a little bit different is we're not, the problem with AI is AI is only as good as the data that's out there. You follow? Yeah, exactly. The, this is where we are actually generalizing, okay? From the individual chemical reactions being organized to put together. Let me bring, bring this up. So here's an interesting paper where we mapped out all the molecular pathways of osteoarthritis. I'll show you that. Um, and by the way, no one's funding us for this. So now what we want to do is our only, because we are creating a radical solution, we're going to, basically we can do work faster than MIT or Harvard can. I can say that now authoritatively. So let me show you this. So this is something we did in two years, okay? Can you guys see this? Wow. Okay? Yeah. We took every molecular pathway, every paper, 100,000 papers written on knee arthritis. 500 million people have this on the planet. So 
we've again open sourced it. Anyone can go. You're here. All the cells in the synovial tissue. Okay, and I can go back to cartilage. It, your cartilage has only one cell type called chondrocytes. Chondrocytes, different um, chemicals can land on it. One of them are cytokines. These are the about 15 major cytokines that can land on your chondrocytes and elicit uh, inflammation. Okay, the green things are inflammatory molecules. MMPP13. It destroys cartilage. And when it destroys cartilage, I can map to you from the known science how IL-1 beta creates MMPP13. And then you can go look at the actual paper. Do you see that? Uh, I think I got to move that paper over here. Sorry. When it brought up that paper, um, go here. This is brilliant. Yeah. So what we're doing is, uh, do you see the paper itself? I don't see the paper. I just see the uh, catabolic oh, effect map. When you right click now. on that, it went to the other screen. Here's a paper on it. Okay. Oh yeah. There. So anything we're doing is not just. It's not like stuff we're saying. It's not AI. It's the actual wet lab research. Okay. Right. Right. So this can just keep growing and growing and growing. But using this, what we've done is we've taken this um, uh, research, right? And then the next thing we've done is we have literally. Um, let me bring this here. I think I can. Um, okay. Let me show you this now. So we have now taken this research. I got, I got to stop this. So this is a, so with that research, we then mathematically converted all those molecular pathways to chemical equations, which are all backed by, and then we ran all these equations through and we discovered we ran trillions of computations. We found two um, very interesting compounds. Apigenin comes from chamomile flowers and hesperidin comes from bitter orange that have profound effect in combination of reducing inflammation in your body, all right? And then for the first time after 16 years, we went and produced our, manufactured our own product. Now what's cool about this is we've been helping lots and lots of companies. But with this platform, we've shown we can go end to end. So imagine, Rafael, Andres, you guys have an idea, right? Hey, uh, does 5G cause whatever? Okay. Or uh, women, a lot of women's health issues don't get addressed like menopause. Okay. There's more than enough data showing women's particular chemistries are far more sensitive probably than men's. So if you don't have the right nutrients, you're going to affect really all sorts of uh, issues under menopause, anxiety, all these kinds of things. In ancient times, women ate a lot more certain foods, which had certain level of minerals, you know, that gave you proper support, mental support. So with this technology, what we want to do is we want to say, Andres, you could be Andres Institute of Technology. You could use our framework, take a question, go raise your own money, be the benefactor and perform the research. We can publish a papers and we can get it out there, but we can show all the evidence-based mechanistic science. Okay. I have a particular project I need to propose to you afterwards. Okay. Very specific. Yes, but this is amazing. And I want to say when I saw this map or even just you mentioning, we can argue about base models and chemical, whatever, but this work that you are showing there is what I would have expected the establishment to do, you know, they're not going to do it, man. Yeah, of course. I know by they, now why, but this they've is, degenerated this is into just getting work. grants, getting yes. grants, getting grants. If you talk, go, I get, I, I challenge anyone, go to a university and go see, go see what a professor is doing there, writing grants, writing grants. He's got a grant writer. Oh, I got to get, I got this graduate student. I need to get grants. Uh, are you, are you interested in solving the problem? Oh, cancer. Oh yeah. Yeah. I got to write this grant. They are so far away from the problem. This is why you see so much fraud in science now. You saw last year that professor at Minnesota, for 16 years, he was photoshopping pictures of Western blots, a tenured professor, and $3.7 billion of Alzheimer's research went into his theory by all of his other guys who all hang out with him, who created a mafia cabal. Exactly. Uh, Someone had to take the fall. You have to understand it wasn't just him. But he didn't take a fall. He still got his house in Martha's Vineyard. No right. fall was taken, Andreas. He, yeah. not, you don't, it was a news that came out on Daily Mail a couple of days and it's gone. Yeah. Four professors at Dana-Farber type in right now, fraudulent research. Nothing ever happens to academics. Have you known that? They're like the Brahmins of the establishment. Nothing ever happens to them. They're fully protected. 
They get to keep their tenured positions. They're not in prison for 22 years, but a, a dark skinned guy goes and steals a loaf of bread right from somewhere to, oh my God, can you believe he did that? This is horrible. These people are out there. <laughs> the, Brahmin, the, Brahmin, the, the Brahmins are like the Jesuits for, right. for the Indians. Top Harvard yeah. cancer researchers accused of scientific <laughs> Nothing has happened to them. No. Because no. you know why? They're all fucking fraudulent. Accused is all it is. You're right. I thought, right. They didn't, so they didn't even get untenured, you're saying? They Nothing happens to them. No, they're not in jail. jail. They're well, not yeah, yeah, but, jail. But, but didn't they like basically can he like he has to like retire now, right? Or something? Yeah, but whatever. Okay, but he, is okay. he gonna lose his house on Martha's Vineyard? It's no, probably extension. Probably he's not. gonna retire into a bigger house. Yeah, exactly. yeah, bigger house. And go look at academics, insurance policies, and and investment. Oh, yeah. It's called TIA CREF. TIAA CREF. It's like they get the best health care, they get the best pension. Ugh. Yeah. So what I'm saying is nothing will happen to these people. Uh, type in Minnesota, okay? Minnesota Alzheimer's fraud research, and you'll find that. And that came out about, I think, a year and a half ago. Right? Wow. Yeah. Nothing has happened to this guy. He totally had Photoshop. He photoshopped pictures, man. That's in so the nice. biggest That's journals. Nice. He photoshopped balls into the brain, man. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. So... What I'm trying to say is when you see this egregious nature, this is why we must call these people Zionist cocksuckers and must come up with words like that. We must lose all disrespect for all respect for them. They deserve to be lashed. They deserve it. What do, you think it would, what do you think it would be like if you were raised a Kennedy or a Brahmin? You know what I mean? What do you How mean would, if I were raised a Kennedy? Or a Brahmin, you know what I mean? How would you have felt if you were raised, you know, because like you're, you're a big part well, of you is that you're so powerful. And despite, you know, uh, circumstances, you're not, you're not like lucky, you know, you are, you're blessed, but you're not like privileged and spoiled. But what if you were, what would you think if, like, would you think you would have ended up this way if you were a Brahmin instead? Well, I think uh, definitely because, but you have to understand this. Um, that my great grandfather, I still remember him. I see him every day in my mind's eye. He was an indentured slave. Right. He was deeply a spiritual being. He worked in the fields, you know, until he was 93 years old. He was, if anything, a God on earth that I saw, a hardworking guy who had deep connection to God. And, but was not like, oh, I'm not going to go do meditation now, you know, right. now I'm going to chill out, like burn my incense. No. Very different, very different being. Okay. So I have great reverence for him, you know, and the work that he did. So I've seen people, Andres, and I saw the same kind of people when I moved to New Jersey, hardworking immigrants who worked their butt off. And I have great, for whatever it is, I have great uh, reverence for people who work honestly and work, man. And I fucking hate these people who cheat. I, I, I can't tell you how much anger and hatred I have. Uh, Vivek the snake fucking makes up a useless drug. Think about what the fuck he did. All of his money is stolen fucking money. And people are following. No one's following him. He's shoved down people's throats. Fucker Carlson, like, has he ever suffered in his life? Has he ever worked? So we have to go back to these very core values. People who work hard, who keep up their families, have to go through life's things. I mean, this is these these people are who where I come from, and they didn't have the fortunes I had. I was very you know to go to MIT to learn from the. I mean to see these fucking nerds in action. I've I've been like a Forrest Gump as I've talked about going to the worlds of Hollywood, becoming nominated by the president of uh, Prime Minister of India to run one of the largest innovation centers, and I've seen all these so-called elite people, and they're all scumbags. Ninety nine percent of them. They're not good human beings. So I've given the opportunity to be co-opted by, by them. And I never could do it, man. I have I just can't because I see my great grandfather in my mind's eye. I, I just wonder, like, if you okay. hadn't if you hadn't had that, like, do you think you would have come out this way? Like, do you think, I you, think if you I, were tra raised like them, would you have been like them? I don't think so. Well, what I'm saying is even people who come from below co-opt out and that's what they're hoping how many people you don't know come from below a lot of black bourgeois obama malcolm x is very different you see 
Malcolm went through a similar journey to mine where he's in high school and the teacher, I think, says, um, you know, what do you want to be? He goes, I think he says, I want to be a lawyer. He goes, oh, no. Well, I think you should be happy being a garbage man. That's what you should shoot for. So these personal things that you go through do affect you. And that's why I said the real enlightenment comes when you connect your personal journey, your personal sufferings with the collective. And that's where the lights go off for you. You see? So I think Malcolm did that. Others have done that. I was fortunate to be able to have done that. Not everyone does that, but I never forgot these hardworking people. I have great reverence for them, greater than even Buddha or, you know, Christ ultimately, his life was about fighting. No one, oh, when I repent, God is going to save me. No, what the fuck? Why don't you talk about what Christ did? He whipped the shit out of these Sadducees and Pharisees. Oh, I don't want to talk about that. That's very violent. Well, you should talk about that. Why don't we talk about that temple cleansing? It is the most important incident in the Bible. Why don't right. you take a big fucking microscope and study that? Well, I Absolutely. gave my I gave my life to Christ. I was an alcoholic and I repented one day. Well, okay, that's fucking fine. But what the <laughs> fuck did Christ do? And that world leads to Christian Zionism, where you get lost in okay, it's okay to butcher uh uh things because the rapture is gonna come. Are you fucking I mean it's fucking stupid right. people? I totally agree. The sacrifice of the shepherd for their own immortality. Right. It's not, it's not and what this, the life of Christ was about. Right? It's so fucked up. And this happens <laughs> in Hinduism too. Oh, well, you were a dog in your last life. And that's why you have to clean shit all this life. Okay. That sounds very good. Okay. Beat the fuck out of me. Give me some shit to eat. So these religions mix with political ideologies and then they become opiates of the masses. Marx was right about that too. Or Lenin was right about that. So some of these revolutionaries got certain things right on the money. And we have to recognize that you have to look at the actions these people did. Buddha was about awakening people to see things as they are, not how you wanted them to be and to live a life here and now, not be on a mountaintop meditating and thinking you're better than everyone, right? That's what all these other woo-woo people do. How many woo-woo people, you know, they do yoga. I can do this stretch. I can do... This I can do trichinosis now. I can put my head, but they're an asshole as a human I'm, being. I'm from California, so a yeah. lot. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know if you know Andres and and Raphael. In the a teacher would never teach people meditation and yoga after they only were taught that after they had proved they were a good human being. Yoga and meditation came at the end of a process, not in the beginning. Right. But I did talk oh. to a guru once who I, I was trying to make that point at. And I was like, hey, what do you think of these Americans? You know, because I was taking yoga at three o'clock in the morning to Kundalini. And I thought I was so cool. It's like, what about these other guys who are just doing it, you know, to make their butts look good? You know, and I have my own supplied answer. And he says, it does not matter why someone does yoga, because if you are doing it's like push ups, like there are consequences to doing the work. Like, do you agree with that? Well, there are, but the issue is, you know, these things are highly integrated, all right? I think what begins first is the integrity, the moral fiber of the person, how that's developed and how that goes. You see what I'm saying? So doing, by the way, yoga is not doing postures, you see? Yeah. Yoga was a five-part, multiple-part system of dhyana yoga, right? Kundalini was one part of a prana. I mean, it was a complete system. The ultimate form of yoga was karma yoga, which many, many people realize it's living in the world and living it like a, a lotus who lives, you know, in a, in a shithole, right? Where you live of the world, but you're not fully part of it. So you learn how to live this life as a, a human being, right? And you can't have personal integrity and public integrity be two different things. Booby fucking Kennedy says that. That's pure devil. That's pure Satan talking. I mean, he said that. Go look at the interview he did. Well, you know, my personal integrity and my public integrity are two different things. Yeah, outwardly, and, and he didn't say this, but what he meant was outwardly, I may say I'm for medical freedom and against vaccine mandates, but in my home, people must be vaccinated before they can come to my party, but I'll blame it on my wife. Oh, that's I the mean, least of it, right? Yeah. Right, but I'm saying that just consider that. Just consider what I'm saying, right? So um, 
Yeah, so some anyway, people's egos really do champion. Like certain egos for candidates are champion. Like some people really want that because they want to have that. You know what I mean? That's the lifestyle that they want to have. Um, I, I have a question I wanted to read from the comments. Dr. Shiva, your thoughts on viruses never being isolated by anyone ever. Is that, do you, is that, a quick well, it, look, um, so there, so let's talk about viruses, okay, and the immune system, okay? So when I did my videos, I always said beyond vax and anti vax, if you remember that. The, the, the issue here is there is something called the immune system that we all have. And uncovering that immune system reveals that from an engineering systems point of view, the goal is to create resilient immune system. There could be all sorts of shit there. Whatever it is. You see what I'm saying? Again, this reduction, all their viruses are no virus. That's not the fucking, it's dumb question. Right. The issue well, is- toxins or det detrimental substances, however we define them exactly, yeah. I think here, yeah. the main the main question, just to put it to the point, is because the, the whole virus idea with biological transmission and germ theory then just lends itself to the idea, oh, I'm coughing at you, then you'll get sick immediately. Yeah, but that's- of course, from a systems biology view is BS anyways. That's yeah. what I'm saying. So you don't need to, so what I'm saying is these, new people, these grifters, oh, let's talk about virus and ovaries. Do you believe in virus and ovaries? And why are you doing that? Because you're doing the same reductionist model that Big Pharma is doing. Let's talk about the bigger issue. You have an immune system. I have an immune system. And the issue is, do you have resilience in that immune system? Because the reason that any of these things affect you is that your own body is reacting to the exogenous input, whatever that is, okay? You get an exogenous thing and your body, you know, is constantly working all this shit out. But if you don't have the proper infrastructure and the proper nutrients and the proper uh, adaptogens at any point, your body's going to, something comes, your body overreacts and it goes, eats out his own epithelial tissue, which is what happens when you're affecting things in your lungs or you go attack your own endothelial cells, right? Which Ebola, right? Or you attack your spinal, which is polio and so on. The issue is, and this is a fundamental issue. Are you creating a resilient immune system? Yes or no? And do you want to have public policy that creates resilient immune systems? That's the other thing. So if you want to have public policy that creates resilient immune systems and not have people going like this, well, what creates resilient immune systems? Well, you find out stress has a lot to do with fucking up your shock absorbers in your immune system. And I've written many, many papers on this. You know, my PhD was in systems biology. So I don't just want people to, oh, well, do you believe in viruses or not? And if you don't, I don't know. I'm gonna... It's like, shut the fuck up. You haven't done the work. You're just grifting now because you want to act like you're fighting against the establishment. And you're really not because you're feeding them. Because of your reductionism, they're going to attack you. And we're going to get into the vax, no vax, virus, no virus. It's a fucking stupid question. The issue is, do we want to have public policy that creates strong immune systems? Well, if you want to do that, then are you going to let your kid play out in the dirt with other kids? Why aren't you doing that? OK, let's talk about that research. Are you going to create systems of economic equality or inequality or relative things where everyone can have a chance of prospering? Because we know that the average American only has four hundred dollars in their bank account and they're fucking anxious all the time. What is what happens when you have anxiety, when the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis is constantly being fucked with and you're under fear of flight where well, you're going to have your adrenal destruction? Your body's constantly releasing cortisol. You're going to fuck up your gut brain axis. Well, why don't we fucking talk about that? Why are you talking about virus or no virus? It's like, I want to slap these people. Let's talk about resilient immune systems. Now you find, okay, let's talk about, now you talk about environmental toxins. What happens when you're around glyphosate? What happens when you're around, you know, sound? I mean, there's more than enough data Poor people live in these highways, what it does to their age. I mean, there's multiple things that are screwing up people's immune systems. This is why some people can be exposed to all sorts of stuff and they're cool, right? Nothing happens to them because they know how to modulate that. You know, even big pharma knows when they give a drug, they check the clearance rates. How long does the liver take to detoxify something? How is your liver working, right? So there's many, many systems you can use to support resilience. So when people go to this reductionist model, like you haven't done the work, you're doing podcasts and shit, so you get views and clicks and you're not serving life. 
You're not talking about the real issues and you're letting people get away with murder because it is public policy which has affected our biology for the last 60 years. Policy, 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 which has fucked up your biology, fucked up your immune system. Academia has been using definitions to prolong not dealing with something for decades and decades and decades. Yeah, let's, and just, let's define it so we don't have to actually tackle it. Right. So we know for a fact homes that have dogs going in and out, 70% less than kids' ear infections at a young age. That's pretty cool, right? The other kids are going to doctors all the time. Doctors are putting this and the kid's fucked up by antibiotics, overused by the time he's 10, 15, and then he has other issues, right? So the issue, in my view, is to talk about the immune system. Now, 10 years ago, when they had scientific conferences that I used to go to, that you could go to the immune conferences, or you could go to the cancer conferences, or you can go to the aging conferences. Now they're realizing all the fundamental molecular mechanisms, those diagrams I shared with you, among all those three fields are the same. Aging, cancer, immune system are all linked. It's systems immunology. So this is what we need to focus people on. Now, you know, going back, when you take the systems approach, you can hold these politicians accountable for everything they're fucking doing, right? You create stress in my life. You create this and you create this. It's affecting my body, right? So pro-vax, anti-vax is again, another scam. We have to go to the root cause. And then when we work from that root cause, we can always get to the right solution. Hey, are these things enhancing the resilience of my immune system? Or are they hurting it? Anything that supports resilience, good. Anything that is against resilience, not good policy. So that's how, that's what, when, you know, when you create a car, you put shock absorbers in it, right? So it hits a, a bump and you don't go through the roof. Buildings in all over the world now, when they create skyscrapers are created when an earthquake comes, they're either on some type of damping mechanism that they move a little bit. And you can see a lot of work on this. Japanese have been doing this for years. So resilient systems is what it's about. And you can apply that to health. So you see from an engineering system standpoint, we can now focus in on that's what I need to do. I need to, you know, like that engineer who comes in and tweaks one little uh, bolt and then he says, give me 500 grand. They said, hey, you only worked on it for two minutes. Well, yeah, but it took me, you know, you know, 40 years to tell you what, what little, uh, um, you know, bolt to do. And that's what I'm saying that we need to focus on. The little bolt here is resilient immune systems. So don't let these people take advantage of you, right? Because they all have a scam that they're running. And I see it with all these guys that you say are associated one degree of freedom away from the wellness company, one degree of freedom away from Children's Health Defense Front and so-called medical freedom. They're all scam artists. Because once you talk about resilient health systems, they're all out of business. Right. So imagine that you become the president what are the things that you do and you try to do? Yeah, so great. So every, let me just do a quick little, um, first of all, every Thursdays, guys, at 11 a.m. and 8 p.m., people should go to vashiva.com slash orientation. I literally go through these issues, healthcare being one of them, okay? If you go to, uh, if you go to um, vashiva.com slash orientation, people can sign up for that, okay? But what I'd like you guys to do, because we're talking about our campaign, go to Shiva numeral four president.com. Shiva numeral four president.com. And what you'll see here, just to give you a quick navigation here, first of all, Shiva numeral four president.com. Yeah. So um, if people want to donate, great. When you donate money, I give you lots of books, courses, et cetera, to learn system science. As I keep saying, I don't want to take people's money without being able to reciprocate. It's just sort of the law that how I live by. The second thing is um, people can um, go, if you click on that thing that says on the top of free downloads, and let's start there. If you click on that free downloads and you can scroll down and click on that PDF and open up that PDF because it's a little more clearer. Yeah. And you can eliminate the, so if people get this PDF downloaded and printed, but if you zoom in and you go to the right and come down, you zoom in more, come down, come down. Yeah. And zoom in right there. So every town hall since I launched in April of 2023, see those issues right there, Andres and Rafael. And you can, so healthcare, environment, education, innovation, governance, economy. So in April 18th, when I launched, I started with healthcare. 
And on April 25th, I went to environment. And we've been rotating those every week, like, like clockwork. And in each one of those areas, when if people come there, you'll actually learn a real solution. So if you go to the upper right on, on economy, I actually taught people what is a managed portfolio if you're going to invest. What is a balanced portfolio? How do you do diversification? We actually teach people. Um, we taught people how to, what is the difference between a balance sheet, right? And a cash flow statement and an income statement. 90% of CEOs don't even know the difference, okay? So on healthcare, we have a multiplicity of policies. Number one, the reason that the modern healthcare system is so fucked up is because in, in the 1970s and heading up to 2000, a set of organizational structures were allowed to exist in the healthcare system called GPOs and PBMs, Group Purchasing Organization and Pharmacy Broker Managers. These are middlemen who control the flow of every item into a hospital, GPOs. So if you, God forbid, had to go to a hospital, the pillowcases, the insulin, the, catheter, uh, the, the catheters, the uh, machines are going through three companies. They control the flow and they can create shortages and they can force hospital administrators to buy stuff at higher prices and imagine. GPOs and PBMs need to be put out of business. They were, they were allowed to legally give a hospital administrators corruption. So if you go to COVID, they are the ones who made all the money off selling ventilators, for example, okay? There was a business model. So we need to make GPOs and PBMs illegal in the United States. And those three GPOs now have merged with the three insurance companies. This is why when you get a bill in a hospital, you don't know where your money went. You're getting a bill for $250,000. You don't actually know what the real cost was, okay? That's one. The second thing is the NIH budget only has about 100 million out of its billions for alternative research and alternative health. I believe it should at least be 50-50, okay? Let's research all these things, actual do evidence-based research. That's another clear policy. I'll tell you the third one, medical school, we need to eliminate the, the need for a medical doctor to go to four years of college. It's a waste. In every other country, doctors go right from high school into a six-year direct program, okay? Same with engineering. Because what happens is doctors are going to four years of wasting time partying in undergraduate, and then they go to four years of medical school, another two years of residency. That's eight years of medicine. They have about a million dollars in loans. They can't be family practitioners anymore with all the uh, you know, liability insurance they have to get. They have to go join large hospitals. They can't, they don't even look at your face anymore. Okay. So that's another thing that needs to be eliminated. The other thing relative to education is we need to make the universities become co-signers to student loans. I was one of the first people to put this out. If you have a, you know, in the old days, people went, we learned skills and you got a job. You learned carpentry, you learned plumbing. If you learned engineering, you did that and you went to work. Now, somewhere around after the 1970s and 80s, people went to college. Why? Well, I got to go to college. Why? I got to go to college. Who told you that? Oh, I got to go to college. And then after they come out of college, they have a $250,000 loan. And that is not a student loan. It's a college loan. Who got the money? The money went from the parents to the university. The bank gave it to the university. The university takes the student, student money and they invest it on, the Wall on Wall Street, which goes into their endowment. And the hedge fund managers who ran that are making 50 million bucks. The student leaves college or drops out, has got a $200,000 loan, has no skills. And his university didn't give a fuck about that. He actually did learn any skills. If you make the colleges co-signers, they're going to say, oh, Bobby, uh, I understand you're studying the, uh, you know, the structure of, you know, gamete formation and the sexuality conditions of zebras. Do you think that's going to get you a fucking job? No, you can do that. But we're co-sign your loan. Why don't you study like how to write? Maybe you should learn this or this or this. We don't mind you learning art. Great. But we're not going to co-sign your loan because we need to make sure when you leave, you actually have a skill that you can actually survive and not live in your parents' basement. You see what I'm saying? So making colleges, the co-signers to the student loan, now puts them on residence to make sure the students that they have are actually being educated with something that's, you know, that they can actually survive on. All right? So that's another important policy. When it comes to the environment, you know, genetically, you know, I did the earliest research on this, genetically engineered foods, 
um, were based on a policy of substantial equivalence, which means a GMO is equivalent to a non-GMO product, but that was based on a 1972 um, uh, law that was passed during the Gerald Ford administration for equating two technologies, you say? And what my research revealed was a GMO is not equal to a non-GMO if you use certain criteria like glutathione levels. So we need to make sure that genetically engineered foods is actually using real science to denote the equivalence, right? And we need to go back and fix that. When it comes to the issues of freedom, is that the backdoor government censorship infrastructure to all social media companies must be removed, period. Elon Musk still keeps it up, talks a good game. And Donald Trump is the one on November 16, 2018, who signed CISA into law. And it was unanimously, unanimously voted by the Senate and the House. Think about that. The entire U.S. government violated the First Amendment, which says Congress shall pass no law to bridge freedom of speech. And that's what they did. And you just saw what recently happened. They all voted without a warrant. You could uh, surveil people. Okay. So we don't have a government by the people for the people. We need a revolutionary movement. We need a, a bottoms up movement. That's what we're doing. But we have actual solutions. In the area of healthcare, you yourself with Systems Health can become a health educator and help other people in your local neighborhoods figure out what's the right solution, the right solution for the right person at the right time. I've created that infrastructure, it's here. Whether you elect me president or not, I have the solution for that. Let's go to innovation. You know, when I was elected, when I was um, uh, awarded the first outstanding scientist technologist of Indian origin, when I went back to India on my Fulbright by the prime minister of India, you know, I was asked to revive this entire Indian research environment of 4,000 scientists, the oldest organization, which wasn't producing any great science. India produced two Nobel Prize winners during colonialism, but not one today. Indians have to leave India to come to the United States even to win anything because the entire Indian scientific system is futile. It's still up based on British colonialism. So when I was recruited by the Indian government, I came up with a plan to unleash innovation. I exposed corruption in the Indian government. I had to leave under death threats. And you can read all about it if you go to innovationadvancefreedom.com. Yeah. You're notorious but, in Mothras for that, yeah. Yeah, but I've created a solution, Andreas, that... I can educate anyone on how to innovate. And it's a bottoms up innovation model. I put my money where my mouth is every year. I take eight kids and anyone should go to innovationcorps.org. And if you have children um, and we've created a curriculum. So the idea is what made the United States great was innovation supported by a real robust patent system. That patent system has now been hijacked by Google, Facebook, Microsoft, et cetera. You need so much money to get a patent out and Microsoft and Google, all these companies want to make everything trade secrets. So they own everything, you see? So you can go there, anyone, and apply for a scholarship. I personally, but I, I this system that I created, what is now after I left, Modi invited me back and the Indian government has now adopted all the recommendations I gave for which I was fired and hounded out of India for, okay? So we have that solution. So. If you go look at the issue of governance, it's pretty simple, right? Everyone talks about term limits, but we got to go farther than term limits. We should make sure that, in my view, the when you elect a president, it should be for eight years. A senator should be for eight years. Um, House of Representatives should be for four years. And so, and that's it, you're done. Because you can have this four-year cycle, you're in and you have some co continuity and it's over, okay? You're done. I'm saying extend the House of Representatives for two years to four years, because by the time you walk in, you're on your way out. All your, By the time you get elected to House of Rep, you're, you're working on your next campaign, right? So term limits aren't going to do it. It has to be term limits plus this concept of resonating the frequency during with these four-year cycles, you say? Because think about how much money is spent by all these PACs and money. So if that's gone, it's all always going to be fresh blood coming in at least every four years. All right. The other thing that needs to happen is I've seen the election fraud begins by who gets visibility. Any media company during an election cycle should not be allowed to put any candidate on major news media at all. 
These people must go door to door. They must have real volunteers. What about his? What about his? Just putting his wife on a sitcom? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So, but what I'm saying is that's what needs to happen. Booby Kennedy has no volunteers. He raises twenty million and he hires signature vendors. Because if Fox News is putting on, you know, Vivek the Snake, they're a pack. They should be treated like a political action committee. So during an election cycle, it should be illegal. If you are, if you have real support, where are your volunteers collecting signatures? And you should eliminate that you can use paid signature gatherers to get on the ballot. You see, like these are fundamental things most Americans don't even know about. How is this guy getting on the ballot? Well, he raises a hundred million and then he's paying some fool to go collect signatures. And I'm convinced to get on the ballot, you know, you have to collect signatures. I'm convinced they have a boiler room somewhere. They're writing signatures because I never saw Elizabeth Warren collecting signatures. I never saw Donald Trump collecting signatures. How are these people getting on the ballot? You have to collect 1.5 million signatures in aggregate to get on the ballot in all these states. We were out in the rain and snow collecting signatures. We're enough in Utah and Idaho. Booby Kennedy couldn't even get 1,000 signatures in Idaho. He had to go do a backroom deal to get, get, get um, an extension. You see, these people actually have no ground support, Andres and Rafael. If the, I mean, my volunteers will go out in the rain and snow and collect signatures because they believe in what we're doing. They don't have anyone who believe. You got to pay them. You got to hire a hoe like Shanahan, who was hoeing all her stuff around Silicon Valley. That's who Booby needed to be his fundraiser. You see what I'm saying? It's a world made up of prostitutes, the entire election process. And the way you cut it is you can't, no media, major media company, you know, with this many viewers you can come up with it, can put you on. You can't. It should be illegal. Go out, go to independent media. You know what it'll do? You'll have all these independent media coming up now. Bottoms up journalists. You have to go door to door. You have to go actually show up and do a rally. You have to do standouts, old school. So that's what I think needs to happen on the governance systems. All you know, I was the first one who discovered the the fact that there's these uh, weighted race features on these voting machines and get, got it out there. All those three things I did. All of those vote. There's no reason for vote, voting fucking machines. India, you know, 1.6 billion people. They run a whole election with nothing. And the electoral system, many argue, there's better than here. Why do you need voting machines? Why? Because you're sure that's where, you know, you should make election day, as I've said, should be a national holiday. You have to show up, you know, you give and you have to make these things. I mean, these are very, very simple solutions. They're Luddite solutions. They're old school solutions. You don't need technology for these solutions. I can keep going if you want. When I mean, I, I was going to say at two hours, I don't know how you feel because like, I love it. If you want to answer a couple more questions, Ralph, sure. I'm sure. Is that, that's awesome. I love your energy. Ralph. Yeah. Well, I think actually the, the main points I really wanted to bring up, you mentioned there is one is not really, it's a question by, by a viewer also, and it's not really a trick question. It's maybe you have wants to say something about it. So which democratic country political system would you potentially see as a role model or do you see anything maybe from India or anywhere where you say, oh, this is something that is something to be aspired to? And a, con a question I'd like to connect to is what do you see practically? Because at least in Europe and I guess in the US, it will be similar. A lot of power actually could be very local, even the way the laws are set up. If a city council would be acting properly, you wouldn't even need so much federal government and all these issues which can happen with centralization. So the two part questions, one is, do you see any role models or ideas anywhere that you would say are good? And second part, how would you plan on further distributing the power structure within the political process itself? Because that is something unrelated to, I guess, term limits. I mean, not unrelated, but there's a further step there, how to really make grassroots individual interested in participating in politics and be effective and not be overruled by funding or anything else. Yeah, it's a great question. Um... I think it's a great way to answer it. I, um, so look, I mean, to get to the central point where we started, um, I think the key point to understand when you look at successes, and, and we have to accept there have been some very, very important successes we can learn from throughout history. And those successes in over the last, let's say, 200 years 
in the United States where in late eight, eight, the eight, 1800s and early 1900s, when we had a lot of these workers' movements, started with women leading these movements. And we talk about a lot in our movement for truth, freedom, and health. We have to herald these movements and recognize the success of those movements. It was these movements which began in the late 1800s where working people realized that they needed to self-organize. Those movements ended up in, in a lot of organic bottoms-up trade unions. And those resulted in putting a gun to the head of people like Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is why we eliminated child labor. This is why we got um, you know, water systems, infrastructure. Those things didn't, the elites didn't wanna give anything to, to everyday people. There were mass movements in between 1900 and 1970, close to 250 million working people participated in 11,000 strikes. And these were truly bottoms up movements. So that should be recognized, Rafael. Those, so I'm not going to point to a country. That occurred in the United States, okay? Now, by the 1950s, the elites said, shit, these movements are too dangerous. So the right wing branded all those movements, communist movements, being remote controlled from Russia, which was not true. There were bottoms up American workers movements. And then the left wing took over those movements, the Kennedys, the people like Bernie Sanders, all these people hijacking, and the mobsters ran the trade unions. So by 1970, Wall Street and the trade union leaders had come together. But between 1900 and 1940, the American pie grew. Wages grew for everyone, okay? It was quite extraordinary. By 1970 till today, after this consolidation of power took place and you branded everything, when I said workers unite, oh, that must be communist, fuck you. That's not communist. Karl Marx doesn't own those words. You see, they had to brand that against workers' movements. And so between 1970 till today, what we have is we have the destruction of bottoms up movements. In fact, only 2 million people have struck in the United States in 900 strikes. And what has occurred? The wages of Americans have gone down by $47 trillion collectively. And in the last you know, four years, 200, 600 billionaires increased their wealth by 2.3 trillion. It's been a massive power grab, massive printing of money, transfer of wealth. And this is directly related to the fact that the victories of the American working people were smashed, attacked. And this is why they created the, the Tulsi Gabbards and the fucking Kennedys and the Bernie Sanders and, and the Al Sharptons and the fucker Carlsons to make sure none of these movements ever came up. And that's why we say fuck you to them, because we're going to rebuild those movements. You see? Honoring those people, that's one. I'll give you another example, the Bolshevik Revolution. I was just going to say it. Oh, man, I was trying not to interrupt. I was going to be the Decemberist. Sorry, I keep going. Yeah, the, the October Revolution was one of the bombs that went off. You know, 10 days that shook the world. You can read the work of John Reed, okay? Epic. I mean, you know, you can attack Lenin from, from other things, but man, the shit that the Bolsheviks pulled off, it was the Russian people, more importantly who lost 24, 30 million lives fighting the Nazis. It wasn't Stalin killed these people. It's like, it's the biggest bullshit. I don't know if you know, in the seventies, academics got together and they said, we're gonna equate Stalin with Hitler. I'm not saying Stalin was a good guy by any means, but they need to do, and, and people were, and a friend of mine went to one of these meetings with these scholars and they said, but Stalin didn't kill 20 million people. How are we, how are we gonna do that? And they said, just say it, people will believe it. So all of this was done to make sure that we forgot that what happens when working people mobilize. They, that's what it's all about, Rafael and Andres, to make sure that workers' movements never, ever come up, that we have to pay homage to fucking Kennedy. Are you fucking serious? Right? So that's a very powerful thing. Another thing was in the you know, in India in the 1800s, there were powerful bottoms up revolutionary movements coming up, okay? That were, um, the Sepoy mutiny was one of them. Why Indian soldiers mutinied against the British. And in response, the British hung all these soldiers on telephone poles. And they asked Gandhi what he thought about that. And he goes, oh, I believe the, 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 the punishment was just. That's what you do when you over, you know, when you, <laughs> when you don't obey authority. He's a fucker. And a fake, man. Why can't he just keep his British accent? Why do you have to get that fake? Exactly. Like, it's exactly. Crazy. He's a, yeah. He was a British agent put there. Him, you know, Nehru was made the first prime minister. Nehru, you know, was made the prime minister of India by Mountbatten, 
who was the emperor of India, and Anair was banging his wife, Edwina. I mean, the whole thing is one fucking incestuous fuckfest. And yeah, these are the people who run country. India. I mean, this is a reality. Yeah. So the whole, India never had, but there was a point in Indian history where people were coming up. That was a good movement. But the amount of capital and propaganda that they put to promote Kennedy was quite extraordinary. In the United States, the civil rights movement, when it first started, poor blacks, poor whites were fighting for infrastructure. That's why they fucking parachuted in Martin Luther King. He was controlled by the Kennedys. And they, sub, you know, um, suppressed Malcolm X. Absolutely. But see, we educate people on all this shit. Oh, what do you mean, Martin Luther King? I'm black. I like my Martin Luther King. You can like him, but he was totally fucking compromised. Was clearly an asset that was compromised. Yeah. yeah. In respect. It's like, in no respect was he not compromised. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if this is, Ravi brings up, please elaborate on the reverse Flynn effect, which, you know. Who? Uh, General Flynn? I think I think when, so. I know like the Flynn effect is isn't that like an IQ quotient thing? It's like the uh, uh, sample convention average, the test result set to 100, the deviation 15 to 16 points when the IQ tests were revised. New standard test. I don't really know. I think I don't, I don't know. know. I, got, I got to go study it, guys. Look, yeah, I don't want to talk about something I know. I yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Go study it. Well, but, uh, yeah. if you're asking about IQ, I don't know if that's what you're asking about. What I can tell you is many of the IQ exams were created by the behavioral school. Um, oh, recent uh, decline of IQ outside the dimension of spatial intelligence. Yeah. So my there's been a number of studies that have been done. If you want to just look at, you know, processing power, right? Um, there's been a you know there's been a quite an extraordinary study which shows that toxins in the environment can reduce IQ. You know, one deciliter of certain amount of, uh, you know, concentration can affect IQ. But here's yeah. a bigger question, you know? I, I mean, I, it's a whole nother question I want to go into because we can go into a whole area of it, right? But I think um, there's a bigger question on intelligence itself, right? What is intelligence? But anyway, guys, it's uh, 828. I've really enjoyed it. You guys are uh, very, yeah. very bright. Your I really appreciate right? that you came. Let me like really quickly pull up some of your links for people. And I hope yeah, let, get... let me let me push a couple of important things to beat people into the right direction. Number one, go to Shiva for president, get one of these bumper stickers. And if you and put it bolt, don't just get one of them, leave them on your dining room table, have the balls to put it on the back windshield of your car. A lot of people get these and they don't do anything because 100,000 people see it. Go to our website, volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. The other thing is, if you guys don't, uh, you know, I want to play a video. I don't, I think, I don't know how we play this on both stream yards. I think I'm going to share mine and I, can I play it for you guys? One video? Yeah. Is that yeah, all right? For because sure. the thing I want to push is get involved in our campaign, but fundamentally get involved in learning the science of systems. Okay. So let me, I'm going to stop your screen share. I'm going to go, I'm going to share my screen share that I'm doing on StreamYard. Okay. And then I'm going to play the video here. If that's okay. Is that all right? Yeah. Here we go. So uh... let me, let me just play this video for you guys. That'll give you a deep understanding of, and hopefully inspire you to get involved in the movement for truth, freedom, health. Um, and let me play this. I think I have to, I, oh, I have to make sure. Hold on. Um, let me stop screen. I got to make sure that you can hear sound. There's a sound. Okay, good. Okay, so you guys can hear my sound. Right? Yeah. All right. Now I can go share this sound here. We have allowed our country to be taken over from within. And the end goal is you will have a homogenized world where we will become slaves because there is a condition among the elites that really thinks they're better than you, deep down inside them, that you don't deserve the freedoms you have. They don't. Mm -hmm. This reality is what people need to wake up to, and we need to all unite working people. There's only one movement that can do that, and that is the movement that we started creating here in Massachusetts, the Movement for Truth, Freedom, and Health. Look, I've been a student of politics since I was a four-year-old kid, studying revolutionary movements, left wing, right wing, there is a physics, there's a nuclear science to destroying the establishment. To build a bridge, you need to understand Newton's equation. You need to understand the laws of gravity. You need to understand Poisson's ratio. There is a way to build a revolution. And that's why I put this together.
My goal is to train a army of truth, freedom, and health leaders. We don't need followers like social media. We need leaders, but they need training because the educational system does not teach them history, nothing. So in three hours, that's what I've started doing. That's the solution. Wow. We got to train people first with understanding what a system is, the dynamics of all systems that affect nature. The second is understanding the interconnection between truth, freedom, and health. Freedom is the ability to move freely, communicate freely, talk freely. Without freedom, you cannot convert ideas hypothesis into truth, which is science. And without freedom, you can't really get to truth. And without truth, you make up fake problems and fake solutions, which means you destroy our health. And without health, which is the infrastructure of us and our body, you can't fight for freedom. Truth, freedom, health. Third concept is it has to be bottoms up, working people, people who work uniting. And what the right wing has done is whenever you say working people unite, that must be communist. Meanwhile, they've let the Democrats run unions, which suppress workers, completely corrupt. But when you look at the arc of American history, it's been when working people came up. We need to go local. Every solution I'm coming up with as a part of this movement, we're giving the science, which is the truth, and then we tell people what they can do on the ground. Like with election fraud, you don't need to wait for some lawyer. Our goal is to train people to go local, to go local, to go local, fight locally. Forget lawyers, forget politicians, Forget celebrities, you've got to learn politics. And there is a science to it. They lock us down, we should be ready to shut them down. And the fourth part of this principle is the not so obvious establishment. So when you look at a system, there's always something that disturbs you from getting to your goal. Well, the biggest disturbance is the not so obvious establishment, which are those people who claim they're for you on the left and the right. The Al Sharptons who tell black people I'm for you, the Tucker Carlson's. Do you think any true anti-establishment person will ever be on Fox or CNN? I don't think so. They both mislead working people back into the establishment. Without this solid understanding of political physics and theory, you're screwed. You're going to follow on the left wing, Bernie Sanders. Oh, he said something. Or Robert Kennedy. Scumbags. Or you're going to follow some right wing talk show host. They're not going to lead us to liberation. It's us. We're building a bottoms up movement. And that political physics, it's a nuclear science of change bottoms up. We have to organize to understand that there is people who talk a good game and then look at what they actually do, left and right. I'm sorry, Sean Hannity may say some good things, but I don't see the urgency in his voice to get something done. And it can only come when you weaponize yourself with the right knowledge. You need to be able to identify a rat. You know, Christ didn't go after the Romans, right? It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees who screwed him up, his own quote unquote people. And that's where we're at. So these four concepts I've built into a curriculum where people can go to truthfreedomhealth.com and it's an educational program. We need to train people in political theory. You need to have physics. And I've created that curriculum. People need to get educated. We need to get educated fast. And within a half an hour, an hour, I can teach people two years of MIT control systems. I teach people those concepts. Then I apply it. Anyone can understand it. And then you say, oh, I got to build a bottoms up movement. They have to get politically astute and then they have to go locally and act, not sit there on social media. They have to act locally, defy locally, do civil obedience locally, but with knowledge on how to build a movement. And the Senate campaigns expanded to the movement for truth, freedom and health, and they can find it on truthfreedomhealth.com so people can sign in, they can get access to a bunch of videos. If they want to take a course and become a truth, freedom, health leader, I offer a full scholarship there, but we want people to make a commitment that they'll study, that they'll get certified, that they'll go do activities on the ground. So go to truthfreedomhealth.com. That's epic. It's a wonderful speech. That's yeah. great. And so, I'd just like, like to say that uh, anyone who hasn't uh, done a foray into systems theory and control systems i studied the basic course 10 years ago and i just realized that's the one part of modern science that's really useful so i think it's very exciting and awesome that you with having of course a wide array of knowledge and expertise break it down and make it accessible to people i think i think that's great because that Raphael, is, I, th I think you nailed it man that's what that's academics goes that's the elite that's the controller knowledge and everyone should be up to speed on that so i think that's awesome i think it, yeah so that was a goal here because when i studied controls i said wow this is really like real stuff you can apply to so many systems now the cool thing Raphael, is i discovered those control systems principles show up one to one 
and I wrote a paper on this and I'll, I'll share this with you guys. Um, so I, I, what I discovered was that these ancient systems of share again, please. I think the screen went. Yeah, away. I think I, I think I got to share it with you guys here. Okay. So it took me after I finished my Fulbright in India. You can share this there. I can. I'd have to make this a little bit bigger. Um, I think I can make it here. Okay. Can you see this? So I yeah. wrote a paper um, because what I uncovered was that it's called the uh, the Control Systems Engineering Foundation of Traditional Indian Medicine. And so what I uncovered was, um, as you go through this paper, I discussed the history of Western medicine, which is really for wartime medicine, okay? And then I give the reader a background on mo the modern healthcare system, you know, that the fact is that pharma is actually tanking. That's why they needed Trump to uh, do the vaccines, right? Because they're not make, they, they do more and more money to R&D and less and less new medicines are actually being found because their whole model is fucked up, okay? And then the advent of systems biology, which was really Western biology's effort to get itself out of this mess. Um, and then, you know, so the reader understands where developments are. And then I sort of, in this uh, paper, really talk about control systems engineering, right? Which... What is a basic, but I integrate it, Raphael, it, with, with thermodynamic theory, which pe people didn't make that intersection. So this is your standard system, your what you called your open loop system. And this is what you would call your closed loop system, okay? And then I take the reader on a different journey into the ancient systems of Indian medicine and yoga through all of this. And then what I share is this discovery that I made that these are the words that they use in yoga and Indian medicine. Karma is not some you know afterlife term. It's basically right action. And the fruits of karma are karma fall. And then when you layer in the yogic systems of having a, a mind and the senses, the disturbances that come your way and the sankalpa, your mission, this is what emerges out of this, Andres. And this is what is really the profound piece of this that here's Western engineering. This is what you can study deeply. And this is the ancient systems of yoga. You see, they, they match one to one, but no one has presented it this way. So what's happened is over the last 400 years, those talking about Ayurveda, Siddha, you know, meditation, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. They, they actually don't know. They're just repeating words. But it turns out that the ancient rishis looked at the body as a control system. And so this now gives a profound gateway, this Rosetta Stone, into for us really appreciating these ancient systems of medicine and science. It's the same freaking thing. The body is a system. It has a homeostasis. It tries to get back to homeostasis, which is the goal. You know, you're moving information, matter, and energy through the three forces of transport, conversion, and storage. Anyway, this has evolved at the core of the Truth From Health movement. And then more importantly, I've advanced this in many of the educational systems health education. So at every two months, I've resurrected teaching. You know, I, I think I put about 2,000 doctors through this who are a little more doctors who are getting rebellious against the establishment. So we have the framework, man. So guys like you and others can help get this out, you know? But we have the solutions. My running for president gives people the opportunity to see the stark difference between what we offer and what the swarm offers. We're going to win. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> they're, they're fucking toast. I'm telling you. It's just a matter of time. Their systems are broken. And, they and in don't terms have... of systems theory and analysis, I mean, that was always my optimism, maybe naive, that even from a systems point of view, this cannot ultimately sustain itself. Yeah. It can't. Oh. The thing is, our knowledge, our movement is like molasses. It's very viscous and it just oozes. You know, four years ago when I hit Trump, oh, why are you hitting Trump? He's such a good guy. When I hit Kennedy, oh, you know, you're an asshole. Now, I don't even have to do a lot of tweeting. You'll see Kennedy say something and people go, you know, at him with the arguments that we've been making. So our stuff is getting out there. You cannot stop truth. It, it's viscosity and its stickiness is so powerful. So I know these guys are fucked. It just, we just need to accelerate it by throwing more kerosene on this. And that's what guys like you can do. We'll do it anyway, but... You know, the independent journalists, the smart guys like you guys who get it, get involved, you know, 
Um, it's basically getting you guys into this thing. Oh, let me, well, I don't do, when you go hand out a flyer, it really changes your, it's like you're going out and working out and you're doing a squat. Well, my muscles ache. Why am I doing this? But we have an exercise citizenship muscles. People have been told, well, you know, uh, why, why are you going out handing out a flyer on a corner? Well, when you do that, you have to engage people. People used to do that in villages outside of their balconies. They talk and they have that conversation. Da, da, da. All that's unfortunately gone away. You know, you see architecture, there's no balconies outside anymore. Have you noticed that? It's just very flat, this very brutalism sty style of architecture. So. Yeah, even Stalin would have been upset about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Uh, I just want to say, that's hilarious, man. Om bord burvas vaha tat savitur varenium bargo devas yadi mehidio yono precha deat. Let's yeah. meditate on the glory of the being who's created the yeah. universe, and may we be enlightened by them. Um, but thank you. This has been really informative. Yeah, thanks, I've thanks, Andres. Everyone, Andres gave the Gayatri mantra. I'm gonna do 107 more of those for you later. As okay, great. And you do it times useful. in the morning. Yep. I, I did it earlier. Yeah. I don't know how you useful did. it'll be, but I hope it's helpful because, like, I actually want you to win a lot. It's well, Andreas, good. get involved, man. Where are you? You guys are in California. We are gonna have to co start collecting signatures there. Every state we get on the ballot is a stab to the establishment. We've gotten on the ballot in two states. You know, I'm filing this historic lawsuit on my own against this whole naturalized citizen equals natural born. And it's me going up against nine lawyers and we have them on the run. So it's a lot of fun, but get involved guys and just get the word out. Thanks. Absolutely. All right, everybody, All right, make, sure you you guys guys. To, make sure you guys go to Dr. Shiva, uh, shivaforpresident.com and, you know, check out also his, you know, Shiva systems and revolutions. And yeah, this is awesome. I hope you win. Thanks, Andres. Stay, stay in touch. I will. I I'm glad, will. glad you and Andrew met. Thank you. Talk to you soon. All right, Thanks. guys. Be well. Be the light. Best to you and your families. Namaste. Right, this bye -bye. next story has been suppressed by mainstream media. Let's go to Andreas for more. Everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarians. Recent Tartarians.